Hey everybody, welcome to Goots' Wrestling Pod. I'm your host, Ray Goots. Um, we got a lot to cover later on. We'll have plugs, um, but we'll talk about them later. Right now, we're going to discuss the show that we just watched. The King, We're up to the King of the Ring, 1993. Yes. A show I have waited 31 years to watch. You know, I've always seen a few of these matches, never watched the full match, the full pay-per-view, and now that I did, I will say that I um, liked it, and I'm glad I finally got to watch the whole pay-per-view. How about you? Now that you finally... After close to like three decades, right? 30, like 30 years or whatever, around there, that you finally got to see it after this long. How do you, what did you think? Oh, uh, I mean, I'm glad I watched it, but I think if I so, the results of this show made me stop watching wrestling for five years. Like, not like, oh, I just watched Nitro or, oh, I, I don't watch anything. And every time I, I look up, into it, I'm like, I'm so glad I'm not watching this shit anymore. That's how man, I think if I watch this whole show at 12, and this is not because of the match quality, because the match quality is great, I don't think I ever would I don't think I even would have went back in 1998. Um, Because the way they bury Hogan, I don't think I could have looked past that, even for Austin and The Rock. I just think I would just would have been done. I just think I would have been done forever. Like, I just would have been like, I don't know why I wasted my time with this. I think you and I have a different view of the Hogan match because I'm not seeing it the same. I don't see it the same way you see it. But the I whole show, the they, they kind of bury him the whole show. No, I don't see. I, get it. I, saw it. I think we see things a little differently, but we'll get into that when we get to Hogan's part. You know? Yeah. Um, I mean, the show, so like, from just like a match quality perspective, Bret Hart has an amazing show. But this is this is something I and this is what I want to say to AEW fans because I think this is important to say, right? From a match quality, this is one of the best shows they've put on since they started doing pay per views, right? Yeah, very. It's a very quick watch. It and the thing is, is the time wise, it's still the same amount of time as these other pay per views. Yeah. Still over two hours, close to three hours, but. The, the matches are so they're none of there's no stinkers. It's all kind of just like an easy watch through. There's some stinkers. Before you realize it, it the whole pay per view is over. I could I could watch it in one sitting. Yeah, th there are some stinkers, but I will say this: the even, that, the stinkers aren't even that that bad. Yeah, well, they're not WCW. Stinkers. They're not like WCW Bill Watts stinkers, but they're yeah, yeah, exactly. Stinkers. Exactly. But um, stinkers. But the match quality is fantastic. Bret Hart is doing some incredible shit this whole show. Here's the deal. They go into the fucking toilet as a company for five long fucking years, even though the match quality is at another level, which goes to show you that match quality is not everything. And if that's all that the only thing you're hitching your horse on, it means nothing. Because as good as these matches were, and they're fucking great, guess what happened to me? I stopped watching. I stopped buying the figures. I stopped buying the magazine. I and I know a lot of people who did that too after after this show. So, what I'm, this is my message to Tony Khan, AEW. It's not all about match quality. People are saying uh, Okada and uh, the other guy Osprey. Oh, it's it's game changer things. They don't have good storylines. It doesn't matter if they have nine star matches, according to Big Big Baby Meltzer. No one's gonna give a shit because no one gave a shit about Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels. So. Um, yeah, it's the quality is good, and I agree, match quality is not everything and should not be everything in wrestling. That's yeah. the whole point. Wrestling is as much as we always want to refer to it as a sport, it's a sport this, it's a sport that. Um, at the end of the day, it's not really a sport, yeah, it's performance, I and uh, you could have as the best Broadway actors acting in a Broadway play if the play doesn't have a good plot. This is not a good story. People are still not going to want to watch it. Yeah. And every time I go back and watch these shows from my hiatus, I mean, this is including back in 1998, Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels are putting on banger after banger after banger after banger. Every single time I put on a pay-per-view. And we'll be we'll be exploring that for a long time because we've got a long road to 1998, right? Yeah. And I will say this. Uh, I think 
you and I were different in the sense that you were a big Hulkamaniac growing up. Yeah. I wasn't. And I think because I also was I also was a fan of Warrior, Jake the Snake, uh Macho Man, and um let's let's throw in Hacksaw Jim Duggan. And this wholesale rejection of all of that that Vince did around here. And this whole like that they're old when I was twelve and I'm like a fan. It's it like really turned me off as a twelve year old. It really like it really was like you're telling me what I like is lame and old, and I'm like, I don't even have any hair on my dick. What the fuck are you talking about? You know, hair on the dick. That's yeah. exactly what we're talking about. We're talking no, about no, no. But what I'm saying, dick, guys, what I'm saying. Hold on, let me just let me. Let me I was making a point. I was making a point. Hold on. My yeah. point is, these guys are putting on bangers month after month, right? And you couldn't fucking drag me to the TV to watch. That, that, I mean, I go when I look back and I rewatch these shows, like I love Survivor Series '96. You could have put a gun to my head in November '96 to watch Survivor. I wouldn't. I would have been like, I'm not walking in that building. I'd rather fucking, I'd rather be castrated than go inside that building. And that's a great show, but you, you didn't, you couldn't convince me to become a fan again until 1998. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, I think because you were a Hulkamaniac. The the view you have of like the Hulk Hogan match and stuff is there is different than the way I'm viewing it, is what I'm saying. Oh I yeah, mean, yeah. But I'm saying yeah, like yeah. I I was just I was never gonna accept these the guys they're trying to make the guys as the guys. And not a lot of other people did either because their business goes in the toilet. Yeah, but because I wasn't a Hulkamaniac, I did buy it. I personally right. was like you into did. it. Yeah. You were one of the few. You were one of the few that stuck. Yeah, uh, I, don't think I, stuck would, around. I don't think I was the only one. There's a lot of Bret Hart fans out there, you know? I mean, but uh, listen, I'm a Bret Hart fan, but I became a Bret Hart fan after 1998, going back and watching the archives. I was not a Bret Hart fan while he was wrestling. Same thing with Shawn Michaels. I Wow, you weren't a fan of him during this whole time? Like... No, I wasn't a fan of any of these people. I just completely gave up on everyone. I wasn't a fan of any. I was even. I wasn't even a fan of Hulk Hogan and WCW. Really, even when they were doing the Bret Hart versus Owen Hart storyline, you couldn't were like, give I a shit. Fucking, I don't care about you. Did not care about that. But I'll tell you, I'll, most kids in my school didn't give a shit. We would we would laugh at the kids who still cared. We would be wow. like fucking loser. That you I think care about you me. know what I know. We're only like a few years apart, but I think that when you're young, right, like young, not like as you get older, but when you're like in elementary school. That one two year difference is a big difference, right? Yeah. Because I, in my group of friends, we did care about Bret Hart, and we, the the Bret Hart Owen Hart thing was like a big fucking deal to us. And you know what? Here's the thing: a lot of us, we were already like, ah, like Hogan, he got to, like we were just sick and tired of that. We did we him constantly wearing yellow seemed kind of lame, even though Bret's wearing pink. It's just the yellow and red. It was just so. It was already played out. The eat your vitamins and the say your prayers and grow the hair on your dick. That was so like played out. But it was already played out. Before I mean, I it's played it. out. It's. It, I mean, it definitely feels played out watching it now. But I think there could have been a way to keep him around and not let it be played out. But I think that Vince was trying to trying to downplay him since nineteen again. This whole thing, and it starts at WrestleMania 6, is Vince does not want to be beholden to one guy, right? He wants yeah. to prove that if he points to fucking Duke the Dumpster Drossy and says he's going to main event WrestleMania, we all buy it because of him. And he was struggling, and I think this show is like, that's it. And I know the steroid trial also has something to do with it. That's it. Yeah. I'm getting rid of Hogan. I'm going to make a new guy next month. And, and and that's it. Like I'm like I'm tired of this guy being the guy because, but he suffered a lot, and so did like. Look, here's the. I had I had one friend who who kept up during this era, and I would when Hogan went to WCW, I'm like, how is it? And he's like, oh, it's good, but it's not the same. And I remember one day I went over and I watched a little bit of like Hogan on Saturday night, and I thought it was atrocious, and I didn't. And then when Hogan turned heel. That's when I started getting rumblings that it's good again. In 97, kids are being like, I was like, oh, that shit's lame. Like, no, it's good again. Hogan's a bad guy in this fight. Austin, a stunning Steve Austin. They're like, no, he's called Stone Cold now. These guys are really good. Like, that's when I started getting rumbling that, like, it's starting to change. But, um, yeah, you know, it's just, I, dude, I didn't give a shit about any of this. They couldn't have paid me to watch any of this shit. Yo, you know what's crazy is, like, um, 
back when I was back, obviously back in the day, whenever somebody from WWE went to WCW, it just didn't come off good, right? Mm-hmm. But like when they would, when somebody from WCW would come over to WWF, it was good. And I wonder why that is. And if there is there anybody, has there been anybody? This is pre NWO, by the way, pre NWO mm-hmm. that came in from WWF, went to WCW, where it was actually like, if it either was a step up or at least bare minimum, like not a step down. No. No, the oh, the first person where it becomes a step up is is Hogan. It takes him two years to get there. Because when he becomes comes Hollywood Hogan, it's a whole different presentation. No, no, no. Before NWO. No, pre-NWO. nobody. Nobody before before not nobody before Hogan and, before Scott Hall walked out, nobody. Nobody. I think even think Hulk Hogan. You know what I found out? I learned in Lap Span. WCW could have bought the rights to Real American. It's not owned by WWE, it's owned by the songwriter. So if WCW wanted, they could have ponied up the money and had him come out to Real American, which would have added a lot. And the fact that they wrote that awful fucking song. He's a man. That took a lot out of Hogan. That took a lot out of him in WCW. Like, they just never knew how to present someone. Everyone always looked lesser then. Yeah, I, and I kind of get the sense, like, like uh, I hate to say it, uh, no, I don't hate to say it. I, I'm I'm just gonna say it. Like TNA is a very good example. Whenever yeah. somebody from WBF would go to TNA, it's like a step down, or it's. I guess the only person who really it wasn't, where they still kind of had it was I guess Christian. Kurt Angle. Christian, actually, Christian. yeah, my t- not even my t- Kurt Angle. Kurt Angle. Even he Kurt Angle still put out bangers. He still put yeah, out but bangers. his but his promos weren't as good, and um, yeah, the theme song wasn't as good. Actually, I, I you you said Christian, and actually my theory gets thrown out because Christian did. He stepped up when he went to TNA. He actually mm-hmm. leveled up in TNA. He leveled up. Yeah. He he finally seemed like a big deal because yeah, the thing about Christian was he had it, but Vince didn't see it, and then mm-hmm. when people who saw it, it was easy for it to come out in TNA. Yeah. Whereas WWF is just you, you're you're being held. Well, same thing with Sting. Um, Vince didn't see it in Sting, but Tony Khan and Dixie and and Eric Bischoff and all the other motherfuckers saw it. That's why Sting is is a big deal in other places because he just has it. And AEW, they've already done it with Swerve. Like they Swerve. made, yeah, Swerve's a very good example of he just seems bigger in AEW than he ever did in WWE. Um, or there's someone else too. Um, well, Eddie hmm. Kingston's bigger every day because he keeps. Yeah, that. yeah. Eddie Kingston is bigger. It's conference. It's conference uh, is bigger every day. You know, you know. Actually, you know who? You know who? No, actually, I'm sorry. You know who's a bigger deal in WCW and WWF? His presentation, and everything. Lex Luger. No, that doesn't count. He was a Lex Luger original. Yeah, but WWF. But he's the only guy where his presentation was a downgrade in WWF. Yes. Even though they went all out, they fucked it up. No, what I mean is like going from W, you're like the first national exposure you're getting is WWF. And then when you go to WCW, you're either. Oh, okay. So you know, we're not counting Flexi Lexi. No, because I consider Lex Luger a WCW guy. Okay, good. All right. All right. Like, same for Ricky Steamboat. Same for Ricky Steamboat, you know? Well, then I guess we can consider Scott Hall and Kevin Nash WCW guys because they were uh, Vinny Vegas and. The diamond stuff. Yeah, I mean, um, when they come and do the whole NWO thing, that's, that changes everything. So I don't even count that. Um, I, I was listening to the Laps fan, and they were like, "How fucking stupid!" Because remember, they you know WCW like paid because the like WWE was claiming that they that with um they were like stealing WWE's property by having Scott Hall act the way he was acting, mm-hmm. and WCW paid them like millions. Somebody was like, this is how dumb WCW... All they do is like pull out Diamond Stud tapes and be like, he was acting like this is a Diamond Stud in 1991. And they probably would have won the case. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no, he wasn't really acting like that in Di- as Diamond Stud. Well, no, he. you got to watch some of the promos he is. He's throwing the toothpick. He's doing everything. Really? Oh. Yeah. Terry Taylor. He... What? Terry Taylor. I would say he no, he wasn't technically. I ah, forget. I don't. I don't. I'm sick and tired of this argument. I'm ready to talk. King of the Ring, 1990. Who will be king? Be a part 
of the coronation taking place June 13th, 1993 at the Nutter Center in Ohio. 6,000. They keep saying uh, uh, in the heartland of America, in the heartland of America. They keep beating that into the ground. Starting... Is it in Ohio the heartland of America? I don't, I don't consider it. I don't oh. consider any place drivable from New York to be the heartland. I guess because you could, I mean, but you could drive anywhere from New York, technically. But you can drive to Ohio pretty fast, I think. Uh, it's like, I mean, yeah, I guess eight, ten hours. No, you have to like five, six. To Ohio? Yeah, you can drive to Ohio in like five, six hours. Well, uh, I guess a part I drove of to We drove to Detroit in like eight, nine hours. And we were in Ohio like really fast. Like we, we left at six in the morning. We were there by one, two in the afternoon. Oh, you guys must have been fucking racing down the fucking highway. <laughs> is... I, I don't consider, I consider, um, I consider like Kansas the heartland. Oh, okay. I guess you're right. I drove to from Jersey, like right by the city, because I live right by the city, to Cleveland. It took me eight hours. That's because you're ATV. Yeah. How did you guys not have to stop for gas? That's crazy. We got gas in Ohio. We did stop in Ohio. When you guys got there, it's the only time you got gas. That is crazy. Yeah, and then because... in the morning we got gas again in in uh, in Michigan. You know what? Is you probably were at Ohio's really you know size. We, you, we, we right when we got the board of Ohio, we got gas and food. Yeah, that's what I'm. That's what you're probably thinking. So I went to Cleveland, so it's kind of like in the middle of. But anyways, nobody gives a fuck about these flyover states. But you know who people care about is the King of the Ring. Okay. 6,500 people do care about the King of the Ring. That's how many people were in attendance. Uh, that's a smaller attendance than uh, AEW's big money. Was it big money? Big money? Big, big business? business? Big business. Uh, I mean, WWE is dying. Big business outdrew them. Big business. Yeah, big business outdrew them by about like a uh, 1,500 people. Um, Junior, he welcomes us to the first ever, this is the first ever King of the Ring, and says that eight of the toughest superstars will bang heads in an elimination tournament. And he runs down the matches. And then Jim Ross says it's a sold-out show. He's there with Bobby the Brain Heeman and Randy Savage. And they talk about the title matches that are also part of this show, not including the tournament matches. Mm -hmm. But we're going to start right away with a tournament match. It is the first round match. Of Reza Ramon, who comes out to people chanting one, two, three at him, right? I didn't really hear that. I heard I heard um Jim Ross keep screaming that they're chanting it, but I didn't really hear it on my on the feed. Oh, you didn't? I you heard it a little bit, but then you also saw people doing the one, two, three fingers at it. I definitely I definitely heard Jim Ross like say it over and over again, almost like you know. But you didn't see the people doing this at him? Not really, no. I was like looking for it too. I really didn't see that much one, two, three ness. Crazy. I saw one guy doing this to him, and then I saw another I, guy who had his boot out. That's yeah. two guys. I mean, yeah. well, yeah. I saw I saw two guys jerking off at Sasha Banks last week. That doesn't mean all arena was. <laughs> yeah. So all right. So Razor Ramon versus Bret Hart, who's back to curtain jerking <laughs> after being champion. He's back to curtain jerking. <laughs> uh so this story of this match is Razor Ramon is bigger than Bret Hart. He's more muscular than Bret Hart, and he's taller than Bret Hart. So Bret has to outsmart him, and he's grounding Razor Ramon a lot, who, who is bigger than him. Razor Ramon, though, he throws Bret shoulder first into the post, which is basically Bret Hart's usual spot to start selling. I don't know if you noticed this. He does that a lot. Where Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he to get start beating on him. He just, boom, shoulder first into the post. And Razor starts beating on him and starts beating on Brett. And Bobby tells a very bad uh, Brett kicking out of bed joke. Yeah, that was such a bad joke. It was like, oh, uh, when he goes to sleep, uh, he kicks out. He asks for, uh, like, a wake up call at uh, 123, and then he kicks out before the three. Like, it was so stupid. <laughs> yeah, was one of the I, I did think these three worked a lot better than WrestleMania 9. And. I'm shocked he broke them up so fast. Yeah, you know, um, I don't really like three man boobs. I think they're kind of annoying because people have to like wait for each person to talk. But Bobby the Brain Heenan with Savage and Jim Ross is actually a great combo, and it's because 
Bobby and Savage are kind of at ends, opposite ends mm-hmm. of the court. Uh, and they sometimes kind of get into it. And Jim Ross is the guy who has to keep them both at bay, you know, yeah. mm-hmm. which I, I like that. I like that going. And Jim Ross, this is like peak Jim Ross. Like he is on his game. Like he knows he's quick. Mm-hmm. And he just like calls everything. He just he's just good. But uh, you can tell he likes Bobby both Brady, guys. You can tell what? he like both, he likes both guys. Yeah, he likes both he guys. Um, I don't think he has any money problems. And I get it. I totally get it. I would. I think I would feel the same. I we ragged on Jim Ross a lot when he was the last few pay per views with Messi, Jesse Stephen, Ventura. Yeah, Jesse Ventura, and it was because he was uh, he was jealous. The guy was getting paid more than him, and you're essentially for the same job. I would be annoyed too. I would. Wouldn't you? I think you would be. You know, I, I would be annoyed. So I think. I mean, that uh, happened. That literally happened to me at Caroline's. They had a manager who did nothing, got paid more than me while I was doing everything. Yeah. Yeah, and that that, that demoralizes you and makes you not exactly. want to do your job. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, usually Bobby Heenan makes me laugh. That was a terrible joke. That it was so bad, I had to write it down. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> my favorite part was after he said that joke, Jim Ross didn't understand it, so he had to try to explain it, and then Savage goes. That's useless information. <laughs> I was like, that's so good. Razor Ramon, he misses three consecutive elbow drops for Bret Hart to start firing back. But Razor Ramon sends him sternum first into the buckle. Another great signature Bret Hart selling point. Um, Razor Ramon sets up the Razor's edge, but Bret Hart struggles out of it, and they both jockey for a backslide. And Brett is able to kick off the turnbuckle to flip over Razor Ramon into an inside cradle for a very exciting near fall. That was a fantastic spot. Um, Brett starts arguing with the referee, which allows Razor to cheap shot him. That part was amazing in that match. You mm-hmm. know what I'm talking about? We did that. Yeah. yeah, that was really cool. That was really good work. Uh, Razor Ramon, he, he's another guy. We, we've we been talking about this in Survivor. I mean, last paper you wasn't that good, but he's been on top of his game. I mean, he's a completely different guy since the WCW era. Yeah, definitely. This is probably the By best. The way, a... This is the best. I think 93 is the, his best year as a worker. Yeah. By the way, there's a, I don't know if you notice, there's a guy in the front row in full Hulk Hogan gear. Yes, I see him. I love that guy. He's a full, like, I thought it was Hulk Hogan at first. <laughs> I was like, why is Hogan always just a fan? Um, Razor, Ramon, and Brett, they get perched on the top, and then Razor tries to go for a back suplex, but Brett is able to twerk and turn it, uh, turk, and turn it into a crossbody. He twerked. Win. Or twerked. Yeah, he twerked. He twerked into a crossbody. Uh, I love this first ma- opening match. What did you think? It was great. Um, listen, Bret Hart, definitely, from a work rate perspective, makes a case of why he should be the top guy, but he was wrong. But um, but he uh, and Razor, these two work really well together. You know, when um, Bret Hart went to w- WCW, I really wanted these two to work together in singles matches. And they never do. Bret Hart has really good chemistry with the entire clique. Oh, I don't know about H- uh, Hunter Hearst Helmsley. But the four main clique guys, he fucking is so good in the ring with them. And they shit on him constantly as a person. And like, bro, he gave all of you your best matches. One, two, three, kid, Razor Ramon, Diesel, uh, HBK. He's really good with these guys. And I kind of wish that him and Scott Hall had a few matches in WCW. The only one who really didn't like Brett too much, even to his diet, like even like now, is Scott Hall. Uh Kevin Nash makes what? fun of him too. They think Kevin he's the part. What? They think he's a mark because he loves the belts. But you know what? When Razor Ramon died, though, Bret Hart like gave him a, like a glowing thing. So I think some sometimes like, these guys just say shit to get yeah. like, attention. Yeah, like, I think it's Bret like, Hart. Uh, yeah, they they have mutual they have respect, mutual respect, but they also at the same time go like, I don't fucking like this guy. It's- well, also it's like I need my shoot interview to make money. So if I say Bret Hart's a piece of shit, more people are gonna want to buy the shoot interview. You know? Oh, maybe yeah. If I, I say I, like I, everyone's so fucking great, like no one's gonna want to listen to that. I think I listened to – I think I might have read it in Shawn Michaels' book or Bret Hart's book. It might have been in Bret Hart's book. But when they were first making the click, they actually asked Bret to be in. Yeah. And Bret turned it down because he said, I think that's wrong, that you guys just want to work with each other. 
and oh, just you guys make money off top. That's what about the rest of the guys? Mm -hmm. And he actively turned them down. But I think in the beginning, they all really uh, respected him. I know, I know Sean Waltman, once a kid, he talks about that match very fondly. Him and that's, that, his, uh, that's his best match. Uh, yeah, yeah, he. Um, Sean, uh, yeah, one Xbox talks about it like it's like he 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 talks about it with a lot of joy. Like he's that's not like, like oh. that was the first, maybe second. That was like the second, like truly great match. Well, yeah, I would say third. The first two are Ric Flair, perfect at the Raw. Then it's one, two, three, Kid Razor Ramon. Which, by the way, that's that's the best Raw so far. So, like, we're not reviewing Raws. But as of as of King of the Ring 93, the best episode of Raw, and I still think it would definitely be in the top 30 episodes of Raw of all time, is the one, two, three kid episode. You know what else happens in that episode? What? Shawn Michael I mean, Marty Jenny comes out of the crowd and challenges Shawn Michaels and beats him for the belt. That's how the show ends. So the show begins with the one, two, three kid angle, and it ends with Sean Marty. And because of that Marty thing, Sean brings in Diesel. So like it's a really good like um storyline building episode. That sounds like a a good episode. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I would we can start reviewing Ross, but not right now. I guess no, that's two minutes. Yeah, it's too, too much. much but too much work. It does sound interesting, and um, it's a good I mean, Raw. I I've sure I forget the date, but people should watch it. It's everyone know. I'm sure it'll be just look up one two three kid beats Razor Ramon. It's only an hour too, so it's not like it's three. Yeah, hours. no. To circle back to the original point, you're absolutely right. Brett has strangely has great chemistry with every single one of the members of the clique, you know? Yeah. Do you know if he ever wrestled um, Just H? Incredible? Uh, PJ... uh, maybe on Superstars or a Raw, because I don't remember. I don't, I, look, I've seen the pay-per-views, most of them, but I have not watched... I think I watched 195 Raw and 196 Raw. I haven't watched a lot of Raws from that era. So maybe he did. Um, but I know he wrestled Hunter in 97, and I don't know if it's any good or not. I mean, I'll put it this way. Bret Hart doesn't doesn't like Hunter, so I'm, I'm guessing the matches aren't that good. Yeah, he he. I think... Uh, and Hunter doesn't like Bret, so... Yeah, I don't think those two like each other, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I don't think I don't think they had good chemistry in the ring, but I could be wrong. I but I know for a fact Brett and Hunter wrestled on Raw in '97 at some point. I know Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart like each other now, like they're pretty tight now. Did you ever see we were, we were talking about the Bret Hart versus X one to three kid match? Did you ever watch that match in AEW with CM Punk versus Darby and he? He does a lot of the same spots. Oh no, I, I didn't realize he did that. I did watch that match, but uh, that you talking about the match when he first came back? Yeah, and then he like he does a lot of the same like moments that Brett and One Street Kid does. And I, I don't recall them yeah. doing that. But... He was such a yeah. Like one thing about CM Punk, he really like if he likes something, he really lifts it. Like yeah. he takes it and puts it into his own stuff. I mean, you know. Look, I think that, like, you know how, like, they have these channels where they just show things over and over again? Like, they, like you know, like, they have these apps, Pluto TV and fucking um, Roku. They have, like, these channels now. They just air, like, marathons all day long of shit. Like, they have a yes. song. If, you, if WWE on Peacock had, like, just a Bret Hart channel, and you just, it was just every Bret Hart match, you know, I would I would have that on all day long. Like, how could you ever be bored of that? I just, just his matches. Nothing else. You, there's nothing else on that channel. It just goes... Throughout his matches, from the Stampede to WCW, I'd watch. That. I think uh, that's very funny, but I think that's actually very true. I think if there was, I, I think yeah, damn, that's a fucking great idea because on Peacock they actually had this thing where it's just like, uh, um, yeah, like there's like I think there's like a Golden Girls like, channel and shit. Yeah, yeah, like there's an actual channel. They have actually a channel that just plays something and then you just kind of tune in whenever you want. They should just have a Bret Hart channel where it's just like. Not just even. I don't all, even want his promos. I just want his matches. Yeah, they should just all his matches. I think you're right. I would. I would every once in a while just tune in just because. They, oh, oh, what, what match they have? There's so they much. They should fun. do that. Like, like they should do that. Like, um, for like the like like when they, when the WrestleMania season, they should just have a channel with like the WrestleManias on a loop. Like, yeah, I think people yeah. would watch. It would be fun to watch. But like, even like when someone like when Bray Wyatt died, just have a channel that would just 
and I know it's a lot of editing, but I think it's worth it. Just the channel of just Bray Wyatt's matches on a loop or and his promos. Like, I think that'd be a lot of fun. And I think like, you know, when Hogan dies, God forbid, or Sting, you just have it on a loop. Yeah. I think that's very funny, by the way. That was a very funny. But Bret Hart would be the best channel. I don't think you'd ever be bored. I think like like I've been sitting here for nine hours and I and I can't stop watching Bret Hart matches. Yeah, I agree. I agree. We let's move this right along. Uh they show a recap of superstars where they show you the Undertaker and he's choking out Giant Gonzalez. But from behind, he gets attacked by Mr. Hughes, who hits him with his own. Well, they really didn't want Undertaker to have good matches in 1993, huh? Yeah, but it was pretty cool seeing Mr. Hughes uh, in WWF. He came from WSW, same gimmick, same everything, pretty much, right? I think the only difference was they gave him, like, a hat or something. (laughs) I don't know. Um, Pretty much same gimmick. Um, so it's gonna he lead comes to and goes. He comes and goes here in WWF. Yeah, this is gonna lead to match number two. It's another tournament first round match. Mister Hughes, who still has Undertaker's urn, he's with Harvey Whippleman, and you're gonna be fighting Mister um, Perfect, who throws his towel right at Mister Hughes. I like that part. Uh, Mister Hughes is a big, powerful man, but let me tell you, this this big guy, he can run the ropes. He's fast for his size, and he runs the ropes. It's like, because of his size, when he's run the ropes, it's like a train coming at you. And perfect, uh, he gets hit, perfect, and he goes down a couple of times. But perfect does a ability where he takes one of his running, like, rams, and he turns it into a beautiful-looking arm drag. And a, he drop kicks him and stuff, but he can't take Mr. Hughes off his feet because Mr. Hughes is uh, very big. And then... Um, one hit from Mr. Hughes sends Mr. Perfect over the top ropes. I just it's the floor. I just noticed this is a match between Misters. Mr. Perfect versus yeah. Mr. Hughes. The Miss the Battle of the Misters. Battle of the Misters, yeah. Um Perfect tries to like fight back, but like every hit from to Mr. Hughes is like having no effect on it because he's you know supposed to be big. But during the match, they ask uh Bret Hart and a little different small screen if he'll like to who he would like to face. In this matchup, Mr. Perfect or Mr. Hughes? And he says, I'd rather go for Mr. Perfect uh, because Mr. Perfect is more endurance brace, uh, endurance based, and Mr. Hughes is brawling on, you know, I, I just also like Perfect better. And that's what he says. This is going to come back to haunt him later on. But as Brett is finishing up, Perfect and Hughes, they, they, botch, they botch a move and they both fall down. Uh, I don't know if they're, I forget what they were trying to go for, but they basically both fall. And then Perfect starts firing back, which annoys Mr. Hughes. So he grabs the uh, urn and he hits Mr. Perfect over the head for the DQ victory for Mr. Perfect. While I did not like the DQ finish, I didn't think this was a bad match either. This wasn't bad. It was fun still. It wasn't bad, but um, it also, like, it was just, like, getting it out of the way. I don't know. I... Kind of feel like with the urn and stuff, I kind of felt like it was, I was surprised that Undertaker didn't really make an appearance or they do anything with yeah. it. Yeah, I thought, missed, I thought you know, under like because they did that whole preview right before, they should have had the Undertaker come out. I don't know why they did it. Why didn't Undertaker come out? Maybe they were, maybe they were doing he's injured, so like they could build up Hughes and Giant Gonzalez, but I don't even know why. I do now, I do remember they brought in Mr. Hughes for a little bit, but like he goes away and it goes right back to Giant Gonzalez. I don't know why Undertaker needs to feel like. You're adding another. Maybe they brought in Mr. Hughes because they're like, we need someone who can kind of work because this guy can't work at all. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Slam right. it maybe. goes back to Undertaker, Giant Gonzalez. Man, maybe you're right about that. Maybe they're just like, yo, we need, dude, we just need to give this guy a couple more months of training and he should be ready. That's probably what they were thinking. Like in the meantime, rest of Mr. Hughes. <laughs> Listen, we'll bring him to the performance center. Like we don't have one yet. And they're like, oh fuck, shit. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, where's that next? Where's the performance center? It's on. It's 20 years behind. <laughs> Damn it. No, 30. 30. They're going to have it until 30. 30 years behind, yes. 30 years away from where we need it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to go to match number three, the third first round matchup. It's Bam Bam Bigelow versus Jim Duggan, who's wearing that double strap singlet, blue singlet with the American flag on the back. Uh, Whenever I, I see him that, I know it's like the end of his WWF run. Do you have that figure? They made a figure of this. No, I heard it's it? rare though. Yeah, it was one of those exclusives. Yeah, it, I like I like this outfit though. 
You don't like it? Uh no. I like his I like his old I like his trunks look. Oh, you know what? I see it now. I was gonna ask you, speaking of outfits, I was gonna say what kind of t shirt do you have on today? But you have an MTV shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I kind of stopped that gimmick because we Oh, because you don't like Jim Duggan. Why do you hate him so much? It's not because of Jim Duggan, it's because <laughs> I just stopped the gimmick. All right. So, anyways, this is this is the Battle of the Bulge. As these guys collide a whole bunch of times at the beginning, they're both really big guys. And they're trying to show that you just can't knock these any one of these guys down. And um, Duggan is able to drop Bam Bam Bigelow, who rolls outside at the end of this. And he's just like, man, I can't take it. At the reset, Duggan kind of runs into the buckles, ribs first, and he hurts his ribs. And this is going to be the story of the match as Bam Bam starts the beat down on Jim Duggan, focusing on his ribs. Now, even though uh, Duggan's ribs are hurt, Savage and Jim Ross says, he'll never quit. This guy's never going to quit. And Bobby Heenan says, he's known as a quitter in Glenn Falls. <laughs> that was really funny. Glenn that Falls, is- Jim Duggan's hometown. I thought that was really funny. He said that. He's known as a quitter in Glenn Falls, you know. That was funny. Um, yeah. Um, Duggan, but when he said that, Jim Ross and Savage both get so annoyed with him. Right? And I know they're not really annoyed, but the way like these guys play it off, it sounds like, it just sounds real, you know? Like, they're just like, yeah. oh, like how could you say that? Like, Jesus, Dude, he, there, It was so funny how, like, they would get annoyed with him at times. Yeah, yeah. So, like, when I was a kid, I used to, I really thought these guys didn't like each other and stuff like that, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's how good it was, you know? JR was going to continue to, he's going to continue to have this with like Jerry Lawler, right? Yeah, and Paul like where, Yeah, where he'll get really annoyed at some of the stuff Jerry Lawler would say, like, or he would act really annoyed. To the point, I really did not know that these guys liked each other until like, like years later, I'm like, oh, they actually like each other. It was kind of. I think he does. So I think Jim Ross does get annoyed, even if he does like you. So like, I think some of it is acting, but some of it is he would get annoyed if you like played too much and he's like trying to call the match. Oh, maybe, yeah. That but I think I think Vince liked, and I think Jim Ross said Vince has yelled in his ear and it like got him mad and he snapped on the air and Vince has been like, that's what I'm talking about. So I think sometimes when Jim Ross is mad, Vince is calling him like probably like a fucking cunt and a piece of shit in his ear. You fucking cunt. And he goes, damn it, Bobby. Don't say that about Jim Duggan. He goes, that's what I'm talking about. That's good yeah. shit. I, yeah, I remember there's a story where um, he's just berating Jim Ross in his ear and Jim Ross just goes off on Jerry Lawler and he goes, yeah. Yeah, that's what I want you to do, you fucking fat faggot, or something like you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> God, he's such uh, Vince is such a fucking animal. Yeah. Oh fuck, this arm that I got is too stiff. Even, anyway, all right. Jim's so, Duggan mm-hmm. during this match, uh, as uh, Bam Bam Bigelow is beating on Jim Duggan, Jim Duggan is able to bite Bam Bam Bigelow on the nose to get out of a bear hug, and he goes for his three point stance, but Bam Bam Bigelow moves, so Jim. Duggan goes head first into the turnbuckle and he falls down, which allows Bam Bam to climb up to the top and hit his flying headbutt for the win. I like this match as well. Um, I these two guys, they're they're they could they're both big guys who can move, you know. Well, this was a good like uh passing the torch, whereas like Jim Duggan is now old and he's getting phased out, and Bam Bam is, you know, the next big thing, Brock Lesnar. And, you know, like, Hacksaw Jim Duncan did a very good job of putting over how impressive. Because, you know, Bam Bam gets a bye. So you're not going to see him until the main event. Yes. So Hacksaw really has to make it look like, oh, Bret Hart or, or Perfect are fucked if they get their hands on this guy. Yes. So, so I thought Jim Duncan did a great job in putting him over. He made him look like a million bucks. Yes, I agree. In the back, we have Terry Taylor in his Taylor made tux. With the smoking guns, the Stein and the Steiner brothers for a Coliseum video. And they talk about the eight man tag they're going to have in this later on tonight. Billy Gunn, he says it's going to be like a mini battle royal. Also, he said he mentions how he likes ass. And then he said everybody loves the acclaimed. 
you know. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, Bart Gunn says something nobody cares. And then Scott Steiner is asked about his finisher, the Frankensteiner. And Scott just kind of garbled like, no, 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 if you hit any of these guys. You know, Scott Steiner, he garbles his words throughout his career, right? Yeah. I think he has some kind of like speech impediment, right? Like a problem? It's called probably injecting steroids directly into your fucking... Oh, yeah. Sometimes I can't understand. He's like... Rawr, rawr. And then Rick Steiner ends the segment by just barking into the mic. Um, <laughs> it was crazy. To, it was crazy that, dude. Like you understand. Like if we keep this going, like we're gonna be talking about Billy Gunn when we get up to, uh, we get up to um, Revolution twenty twenty four. Like that's insane. Dude, we're gonna be talking about Sting to Revolution. I know, but like, but like Billy Gunn. Like I never would have thought if you said to me, someone on this card is gonna still be wrestling. In 2024, when you're 43 years old, um, and your parents are gonna be gone, I probably would have guessed either Scott Steiner, or maybe Razor Ramon. I don't think I would have guessed fucking Billy Gunn. We could play this game right now. Who do you think? That's with the, the WrestleMania card coming up. Oh, yeah, the WrestleMania card coming up right now. Who do you think will still be around when mm. we're in our 60s? In 31 years? No, well, 60s yeah. is easy. No, no. Fine. Um, Let's go 30 years. 60, 60, what, 70? Yeah, when we're in our 70s. That's when, if, we were in our, 70s. if we were in our 40s in the 90s, we'd be in our 70s right now, and Billy Gunn would still be wrestling. Okay, yeah, yeah, good point, good point. Okay. Uh, I'm going to say Grayson Waller. Oh, Grayson Waller is a good choice. Good, good choice. And actually, him, him, and Braun Breaker are going to be still wrestling when we're in our seventies. We can picture Braun Breaker. The only thing is, I would say he's not on WrestleMania. He's not in the WrestleMania card yet. Oh he's... yeah, it's great. Wait, I don't even know if Grayson Waller is. Let's look at the card. Sorry. Yeah. Um. No, but yeah, I I, I know what you mean though. I think that's fair. I would say Dominic. I think Dominic could still be going. I can see Dominic. I can see yeah. Dominic. I can see Dominic. I don't think he's wrestling a style where he's going to hurt his body. Um, I can't believe, dude, I can't believe in 30 years we're going to be in our 70s. Fucking, uh, yeah, but I don't, if we live that long. Uh, yeah, a lot of these guys actually won't be around because a lot I could see are... Rhea. I could see Rhea. She'd be in her 50s. Yeah. Um, I, no, I don't look, I don't think Rhea will be around. And the reason why is because this is not, Remember, I'm not in the wrestling business. I don't make the I don't make these calls, but I think wrestling, um, especially for a woman, she could end up getting married and decide to have kids, and that could kick her out of the game. You know? Yeah, what I'm but it, but we're talking about thirty years. So here's my thing. Now that Vince is gone, I feel like a lot of those preconceived notions are gone. So she could uh, leave. She's 27 right now. She could leave when she's 30, have two kids. Come back at like 39, 40 and wrestle for a few years, leave again, and then come back in her 50s and have like a few. Oh, years. you think she'll do one of those things? She'll leave and come back and leave and come back? Yeah. And I don't think like she'll have the same position she always. Yeah. I, I think now, I think now, especially with uh, TKO, Vince is gone, gone. And I think a lot, and I think soon all his minions are going to be gone. And I think if, especially if there's a woman, like a normal woman in power. They're gonna let these female wrestlers to go away, have kids, and come back and like be pushed again. So, do you think she would want to come back? What if like she's like, I love being a mom. No, I think Rhea likes the attention. Okay, that's fair. Mm -hmm. Um, I definitely. I also think, think she likes uh, the money. I. What else is she gonna do? Like. Yeah, I definitely think. Uh, I don't. These these following people have not been announced for uh, WrestleMania, so. Uh, you know, they're not announced for us. I mean, just look at also the other one I could see, but again, it's only because he's part time. Logan Paul, Logan Paul, be 58 in 30 years. I don't think he'll be wanting to wrestle when he's 58. I, I think th he's so loaded with money, I don't think he'll want to put his body. Through. I think he's going to get canceled, and the only thing he's going to be able to do is wrestle for TNA. I think him and his brother are going to face that's, a scandal, that's, dude. I think, he, I mean, he's rich, he's a he, he's a I don't think he'll need to wrestle, but in in WWF. In mm -hmm. WWE, they're not on the WrestleMania card, but Dominic Mysterio, Grayson Waller, which I agree. Um, 
Braun Breaker and Tiffany Stratton, probably. Tiffany Stratton, I could see. Uh... Yeah, Tiffany Stratton, Rhea All right. Ripley. All right, All right, let's right. get back. Fuck, fuck these people. Let's let's move on. Yeah. Terry T- yeah, after that interview, uh, we're gonna go to our fourth match, the last of the first round in the tournament match. Lex Luger, who gets in the ring with a very large mirror, still in the ring. And Bobby the Brain Heenan does a brain scan thing about Lex probably having a screwdriver in his forearm. They keep mentioning that because he's got that metal plate in his forearm. And the referees are trying to get him to put a pad on his forearm. They say, if you don't put that on, you just automatically lose this match. We want a fair matchup against Tatanka, who runs down. And he and Lex Luger attacks him right away. And he throws him over the top rope so he can keep going back to posing in front of the mirror. Tatanka gets back in the ring and he shoves the mirror onto Lex Luger, dumps it on top of him. And the match is on. Lex Luger, he gets chopped over the top ropes, but back in the ring, Tatanka takes the fight to Lex Luger. Savage says Tatanka knows that there's a 15-minute time limit. And Bobby the Bobby the Brain Heenan says Tatanka doesn't understand what 15 minutes is. Tatanka thinks it's a third of the moon. Many moon come for I win that. I love how blatantly racist they are. Like, like they're, not, yeah. they're not even trying to hide it. Yeah, it's uh, he goes, Tatanka knows he's got to put this away because he only got 15 minutes. He goes, Tatanka doesn't know what 15 minutes is. He thinks it's a third of the moon. Like, many moon come, I win match. <laughs> Dude, you know what I was watching the other day? Um, I was so watching, Dem- they have a best of demolition on the network. Yeah. And, uh, they show WrestleMania 4 when they fought Strike Force. And Jesse Ventura just goes, like, I bet, like, nothing's going on. Like, it's just, like, there's, like, Gorilla Silent for a second. He goes, I bet you Chico wishes he was selling tacos in Tijuana. And uh, <laughs> the girl goes, he's not from Tijuana, Jesse. Well, I bet he wishes he... It's just like he just like he just blurts out racism. It's really uh, fun. I think it's... It dude, remember the remember the wonton... The, remember when uh, the last... I think the last thing... This never happened ever again. Ramen the, noodle bunso. The ramen noodle bunso. Everyone on Twitter got so upset. That made, kind of made it funny. Do you remember Twitter was like, I can't believe he's sick. Oh, yeah. People got really upset about it. And I... I you know, I, I made it funnier to me. Yeah. It, it, I understand why people got upset with it. I ramen noodle it, But like... This is wrestling. It's not... It's not ballet. And it's like... You know what? Yeah, okay, whatever. I'm just gonna move past that. Anyways, oh well. They ask, during this match, they asked Bam Bam Bigelow who he prefers to face in this match, and he says he wants the Indian. <laughs> oh god! Jim Ross tells us that that Tatanka is a Lumby Native American, and you know who else is part of the Lumby Native American tribe? It's a celebrity from the 80s and 90s, female celebrity, a TV actress. Jane Seymour. No, no, but very good guess. I'll just tell you, it is Heather Locklear. She's a part of... Oh, I didn't know that. I thought she was a lady. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Heather Locklear is a part of the Lumbee uh, Native American tribe, but she's not the most famous one. It is Tatanka. I would say Tatanka is more famous than her. Tatanka is famous yeah, Lex Luger, he back elbows Tatanka right in the face, and then he starts his beat down on Tatanka. He flexes his pecs, which is his pectoral muscles, which flusters JR. With about three minutes left, Tatanka starts firing back, and Lex regains control, but he just can't put Tatanka away because uh, he keeps kicking out. And then as time runs out, Lex gets on the microphone, and he asks for five more minutes because the time has run out. And Tatanka looks like he's about to agree to it when Lex Luger comes and he blindsides Tatanka with an unpadded forearm shot to knock him out. This is technically both men uh, remain. By the way, this is a match of two guys who are at this point in their careers in WBF both undefeated, right? Mm -hmm. And because this is a time limit draw, they're both technically, I guess, undefeated. Uh, but Bam Bam Bigelow will get a bye to move on to the next round. What did you think about this match? Well, it was really good. Um, the crowd was super into it. I uh, I know I said last time we we were talking about WrestleMania Nine that I thought that whole match was Sean. I thought Tatanka did a lot a lot with this too. It was way better than their SummerSlam match, which happens in a year from now. I kind of feel like once Tatanka turns heel, uh, he loses. Uh, he loses a lot. Like he just 
can't handle turning heel well. But right now, Lex is on top of his game. Tatanka's on top of his game. Look, I see this match. It makes sense to me why Vince wants to do something with Lex. What he did was phenomenally fucking stupid. But I get why he wanted to do something with it. Because the guy, they had a really good match. I thought. I thought this, and the crowd was on the edge of their seat. They were they were into both guys. The talk is over, and Lex is over, man. It's really weird because when Tatanka was in the match with Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania, it looked like Tatanka wasn't on his game, right? Yeah. yeah. But in this one, Lex Luger and Tatanka, they kind of have good chemistry. And I think people, you know, we mentioned this before doing these, this podcast and these reviews. People underestimate how good Lex Luger was actually in the ring. Yeah. You know? But uh, I Lex still Luger. like. We're gonna get into it in two weeks when we go SummerSlam '93. But how they, how they capitalize on Lex is one of the biggest. I, he makes so many mistakes, uh, Vince, that it's a wonder. It's a wonder. Like they, 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 he should, dude. He should blow Stone Cold Steve Austin every fucking night. He should. Be, he should really. He should be pooping on Stone Cold's uh, ex wife's head for him. Yeah, yeah. He makes so many mistakes, bro. Starting with Summer, starting with this show, and then SummerSlam '93. He makes so many mistakes. He fucks up so much. All right. Yeah. No, he he will. He he's been ma- all the way up until the seventies. He'd be making mistakes. It's the talent, you know. The thing about Vince is when he has good talent, he it works. But I mean, if he fucks up the talent like he did with Lex, I don't want to get into. I, I don't. I I have so much to say about SummerSlam '93. We can't get into it right now. It's gonna be a nine-hour no, podcast. Yeah. Yeah. So Mean Gene, he is with Red Heart and Mr. Perfect. And uh, Gene brings up, he's a shitster. So he brings up to Brett, hey, you know, he says, did you know that while you were wrestling Mr. Perfect, Brett said he would rather wrestle you than Mr. Hughes? And he asked Brett, is it because you think Perfect is an easier opponent? And Brett's like trying to clarify what he said. But Perfect, you can tell he's a bit offended by that. And he asks if it's because he... He, uh, he asked Brett, is it because you didn't, you don't think you could beat Mr. Hughes? Which now offends Brett Hart, right? And he mm-hmm. says, I think I could have got past Mr. Hughes, and I would have got past you as well. And now they are both start arguing, and Gene tries to settle the mess that he created, really. And then Gene changes the subject. He goes, hey, you know, uh, both your dads, both your dads were great wrestlers. And he goes, hey, did your dads ever uh, fight? And Brett's like, yeah, yeah, my dad beat his dad which pisses off Mr. Perfect. And he goes, your dad never beat my dad. And he goes, hey, I remember SummerSlam. And now I owe you. And he says, don't ever say that your dad beat my dad. And Brett mumbles something like, yeah, if you don't like the truth, that's your problem. And Gene again tries to change the subject and ask if they want to keep this match scientific. And Perfect says his style never changes. And he does what he has to to win because he's a winner. And Brett says, we're in a winner at SummerSlam. And Brett's music starts playing. Mr. Perfect sticks out his hand for a shake and says, may the best man win. And But yanks his hand away right when Brett's about to reach. And he says, gotcha. Just like I'm going to get you out in the ring. And Mean Gene is, Brett leaves to go to the ring. And Mean Gene is left alone, Mr. Perfect. And he asks Perfect about the friendship. Is friendship out the window? And Perfect says, all you Canadians are alike. And I owe you or SummerSlam, and I will prevail. I remember watching this as a kid, mm-hmm. thinking this was a great segment. I thought like they were legit, like started not liking each other. Because remember, at this point, I kind of still think wrestling is real, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And watching it now, it's still just as good. It's pretty good. Uh, these two, these two had good chemistry, and um, man, it's a shame that like uh, after tonight, uh, Mister Perry is never the same after tonight. Yeah, never. This is crazy. This is just promo. I would recommend people just watch this paper. Just this promo it's a, alone. It's a good setup to do a face versus face without. Because I feel like nowadays, like when they do face versus face in WWF, it just becomes like they both just start beating the shit out of each other like, like idiots. Even in AEW, this was like, hey, we're still friends because we're both good guys, but also like, I know I can beat you. Well, I know I can beat you. All right, let's see what happens in the ring. Yeah, yeah. It starts off like, hey, we're friends and we respect each other, but like, uh, you know, like. They start getting a you can you can see the offensiveness building with each yeah. word that they were saying, 
And it becomes like, ah, oh, well, you know, well, we're going to go out there. We're going to do what we're going to do. And you're going to see why I'm better than you. And I like that. And it's going to lead to our fifth match. The first of the King of the Rings semi matches. It is Bret Hart versus Mr. Perfect. Jim Ross points out that Bret has jammed his left finger. And he's got him taped up. Jim Ross and Savage gang up on Bobby the Brain Heenan about how Bobby derailed Mr. Perfect's career. They're saying, like, you know, when he was, you, when you were managing him, you're the reason why Mr. Perfect's career went nowhere, mm -hmm. uh, and including his, his losing his match at SummerSlam. And uh, I thought that was pretty good. A lot of continuity in this. Well, there's a, big, there's a big problem, though, with that. They fucked up. And I can't believe they forgot this. He wasn't the manager of Mr. Perfect. At SummerSlam 91. He was coach. He would have retired. Oh, yeah, you're right. So I'm listening yes. to this and I'm like, he's like, I don't know. I'm like, I'm waiting for Bobby. He'd be like, no, coach was his manager. I sold the contract to coach because I became a full time broadcast journalist, you fucking idiots. Yeah, he and never makes that up. He never brings that up. No, I don't know if they all forgot or Vince was like, maybe Vince was like, I don't want to bring up coach ever again because that was horrible. But um, because it well, coach was terrible. Yeah, but, coach was. I, I'm I'm shocked that they don't bring up they like it's almost like they they change. It's one of the first times I've seen them blatantly change history. That like yeah. you can easily look up. They do it. They do it a lot. I'll never forget. Like they were trying to hide the fact that. Do you remember in 2011 they were trying to hide the fact that Triple H fought Undertaker at, in uh, WrestleMania 17. They were trying to hide that. Yeah, they were like we um they've never really fought before. Like they were saying they weren't like the announcers were forbidden from mentioning. It. Like in the build up. Oh, I don't remember them doing that, but that's stupid because I remember that WrestleMania 17 match. Because Vince thinks that he can control the history, the narrative. Yeah, yeah. You know what? He probably saw this and when he realized that nobody mentioned the coach, he was like, I could just fucking change anything. These idiots don't know anything. Yeah. Like, maybe it's the beginning where he realized wrestling fans. Don't really catch on with continuity as well as the as we think. I mean, do. no, but we do. That's the problem. We we're worse, dude. I think like we're. I don't know about. I think we're probably worse than soap opera fans. Like, there's people that watch like Guiding Light. I don't know. If that's they're probably like, oh yeah, they forgot that thing that happened in '87. But I'll let them. I'll let it slide. And we're like, what about the thing that happened in '87 at NWA? <laughs> this is bullshit. <laughs> like, watch something's gonna happen on T and uh, AW tonight, and like that's gonna contradict something from TNA, and someone's gonna call it out on Twitter. Watch. Yeah, we're like comic book fans. We're just like, what? Dude, we're hardcore. Like, dude, like that. That annoyed me. That actually took me out of the match for a second because I'm like, you can't. And if I was a kid, I would have been even more annoyed. You can't think I'm that dumb that you're gonna expect me to forget about Coach. I will never forget about Coach. <laughs> um, the match starts off even because he's both great wrestlers, both scientific wrestlers. But Perfect starts getting a little bit more aggressive, which gives him the edge over Bret Hart. Bret goes outside, and Mr. Perfect holds the ropes for him to, like, kind of get back in. Hey, come on, get back in the ring. I'm going to hold the ropes for you to get in. And as Bret's coming in, Perfect cheap shots him. The crowd starts turning on Perfect. They're just like, dude, you're the hell. This, you guys are supposed to be friends. While mm -hmm. on the apron, Bret, Bret's on the apron at one point, and Mr. Perfect goes to the ropes, and he just, like, Sends Brett flying into the rails as Perfect gets even dirtier in his tactics as the match is progressing. As it's happening, as Perfect gets uh, aggressive for a while, um, Brett has to start revving up his aggression to kind of like match Perfect's, and he starts attacking Perfect's left leg. Um, there is a great spot where Mr. Perfect has a sleeper on Brett, and Brett finally reaches the ropes, and Perfect has to step off. But as he's stepping off, he actually trips over Brett's feet and he falls, but he blames it on the bum left knee that Brett's been working on the whole time by like slapping it around is the reason why he fell. Yeah. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's like, this is what like when wrestling is at its best, when you take something that happens, that's a mistake, but you improvise to make it a part of the story. Right. That's what a lot of people don't end up doing. Like, for example, what I mean is modern day wrestling, they'll put somebody on the table, they'll do a move on the table, and the table doesn't break. So they just repeat the spot again. You shouldn't do that. You should you the spot was blown, you improvise and you you make it part of the now the storyline of the match instead of redoing that same move, you know? And you'll see it a lot in AW where somebody goes up to the top rope, loses their balance, they fall back down. Then they have to climb the rope back up to do the same spot. And the way a lot of the guys is waiting to get hit 
It's so because dumb. They, they don't know what they're doing. These these yeah. two are two of the best wrestlers to ever live. Yeah. And um uh, by the way, while Perfect is getting more aggressive, Bobby Heenan is more like, oh, I taught him that. I taught him that. Go back to your old tricks, which I which I liked a lot. It was it was the fans are really like into this because you're seeing Mr. Perfect go back to his dark side. Yeah. You see Bobby Heenan mentioning it. It was very reminiscent of like when Bret fought Roddy Piper and Piper was starting to kind of well realizing the only way I could beat this guy is I gotta go back to my dark side. Well, now. you know what else you know what else is great about this is that already by now the 91 SummerSlam was considered a classic, right? Even in yeah. 93. Yeah. So it's pretty like and then and then perfect retired. So I don't think a lot of people think we're never gonna see this match again. And the fact that like you show up at this event and this match is happening and you don't even know this was supposed to happen. Like yes. maybe when you fantasy book, you're like, well, they're not gonna do perfect bread again. They'll probably have Mr. Hughes win. Yeah. Or they'll have like fucking well, Razor Ramon win. You could have some people probably there was like, Yeah, it's possible. It's always a possibility yeah. with but bracket. Yeah. I remember in eighty eight, I heard like a lot of like smart fans in eighty really thought they were gonna do Savage Steamboat again at four. And uh, Bruce Purchase says it was never in the plans, but people got really disappointed because they're because they were like, you know, you could do Savage Steamboat again, like you know. And I think they learned like, well, WWE is never going to give us a second coming of a dream match, and then you get it, and now you're like, holy fuck! And let me tell you something, this was an amazing match, but you, it wasn't advertised, and now you're seeing it, and you're like, I can't believe I'm seeing this again. Yeah, you know? I thought this guy's career was done. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he was doing commentary and stuff. Mm -hmm. So midway, Brett starts firing back, including crotching perfect into the post, and he starts hitting his moves of doom. And as Brett goes to apply the sharpshooter, perfect, out of desperation to get out of the sharpshooter, he grabs Bret Hart's taped fingers that mm -hmm. he jammed in the previous match, and he stomps on him. And Bobby the Brain and Heenan, this is like, he eludes, yes, yes, he learned that from me. He learned that from me. Uh, he's just like loving it. Perfect is just trying now to put on the perfect flex. He's just got to get this match over and done with. But Brett keeps blocking it and he reverses it. So they both go over the top rope and onto the floor. It was like the first time I ever saw like a vertical suplex over the top rope to the floor. Kind of it's thing, crazy. Right? It's fucking crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. When I saw that, I thought it, it looked so dangerous. It still looks very dangerous. We both limp back into the ring. And then Perfect hits an inside cradle, but Brad is able to reverse it for the win. Mr. Perfect can't believe it. He's pissed off. He's cursing. He's kicking the steps. And then he storms back into the ring to confront Brad. And it looks like it's going to be bad. He starts mouthing off to Brad, but then he extends his hand. They shake. This is um, this is a must-watch. We just, I think this is a point in the match. There's a point in this match. I don't know if you if you heard it. Where Randy Savage, he says, I can picture myself in this match. Randy Savage, I feel like Randy, this is when Randy Savage decided I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go somewhere else with this guy's and put me back in the ring. I felt like yes. Randy Savage, I could feel I could hear Randy Savage being like, I wish I was having this match. This is so yes. fucking good. Yeah, yeah. That's... And I'm sitting here like a fucking idiot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He said so I I remember that clearly in this match. He goes, I I can see myself in this match. And after the match is over, they cut to the commentators. And he's jacked up. He's like, he's like, dude, that match took up so much out of me. I took off my hat. I took off my glasses. I took off my jacket. Like, and he's he banging still, on he the could, table. He probably had matches that good back then. I mean, yeah, like, he's like banging on the table. And I felt like this was the point where he was like, I'm not done wrestling. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He should have been done wrestling. That, that, that. Um, yeah. this was so people don't like to. Every now and then, I hear this opinion, and yes. like, this was better than the SummerSlam match. The only yes. reason this isn't heralded as a classic is because that happened at SummerSlam at the Garden, and this happened in Buttfuck, Ohio, at the King of the Ring. But Wait, the heart of the, that's Heart of America, Heartland of America. Fuck them. Um, Ray DeVito was there drooling on himself. So, uh, fucking, this is a great match. This is like, so like you know we're watching the Benoit matches, and and we're like this is state of the art wrestling happening. This is like the evolution of wrestling. This feels like a New Japan match happening in WWF. Um, I think right now, if we just take the WWF uh, pay-per-view matches, this is in the top five of 
Uh, if we go from 85 to 93, this is in the top five of all time, right? I, I, as we stand in 85. I don't know if it's number one. I would put maybe Warrior Savage above it, maybe, but it's in the top five. It's Ooh, fucking awesome. I wouldn't put Warrior Savage above this. I would put... the drama. The drama's better. There's there's drama here, but there's not real drama. I mean, Savage versus uh, Ricky Steamboat. I would put the both matches above this, but this is probably number three. Yeah, this match is really good. I would say out of all the pay per view matches I've seen so far, this um, is also to me. I think this is match of the year. From what I remember, the next two shows suck in '93. And um, I I know everyone loves the Ric Flair Vader match, which we'll get to a Starcade '93. But I think this, I'll make a case that this is the match of the year in 1993. Yeah, I'm okay. This I'm gonna go on a limb. So far from all the pay per view matches we've seen, I think number one, this is better than the first Bret Hart versus Mister Perfect, right? Mm-hmm. I don't I, 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 I don't go understand ahead. why you don't have a plan like. Why? Why you don't have a plan for like them to have a long term feud like in 1994 or something? Maybe they did, but like, dude, like these two. And you know what? I was like, I wish they had another pay per view match. They did uncensored '98, and it stunk. I remember because I saw that one. This is right when I got back in, and I'm like, oh my god, these two were so good at SummerSlam '91. It's not good, Mister Perfect. When he comes back in '97 to WCW, he's just not what he was. He's just not what he was. And I think Bret Hart's. Bret Hart's heart wasn't into WCW because of the screw job and they stink up the joint. Really? Uh, it, oh, that's gonna be depressing to watch that. Dude, Raven has a better match that night than these two. And I Ooh. can't believe it. Raven yeah. and DDP steal yeah. the show from these two. That's DDP's 102 bad. at that point. I'm uh, actually gonna say this promo right before the match and this match mm-hmm. from all the pay-per-views you watch so far, I would say is the best one. I love that's this. over. That's over Savage Steamboat, mm-hmm. WrestleMania three. That's over uh, Red Hart versus Roddy Piper, which I really really like too. All you, I would say this: if you don't, if you're if you're a hardcore Hulkamaniac or you're just not into nineties WWF, but you haven't seen this show like me, just watch this match. You don't have to watch anything else. This match is like it's better than the ninety. It's better than ninety one, and I'll tell you why it's better than ninety one because Mister Perfect. He has his confidence back after the six months away. He's not worried about his back anymore, and he can just fucking go. And Bret Hart has someone that can that can go with him. They're given a lot of time, and um, they're doing shit that you just don't see on WWF television. Yeah. To this day, as I think, these are so good, dude. If this match happened on an AEW show, it would steal the show. It doesn't matter, like. That's the thing. It's like you don't have to do these things where you fucking go through glass. You don't have to do these things where you fucking put your Jump head off a ladder, top rope, light yourself on fire. All you gotta do is this. These guys are just telling a story with their body, and it's better than like most fucking movies. This is what I would do. Yeah, if I if if it was me and I was like I had these two guys, I would just like all right before the match, we're gonna get you guys both in a backstage segment where you guys both kind of just like. Do this like promo thing, right? Where you kind of just like back and forth get and we go, all right, we'll see who's gonna let's see who's better, brother. You know, and then just you go right into the match. That's what that's what I would do. I think and, uh, and I even feel like they wouldn't even do this finish nowadays in either WWF or or AEW. Like they wouldn't have the matches end on a small package, but it was done so well because again, this is what makes Ric Flair's matches special in the NWA before he went to WWF. At a certain point, it's like I'm just gonna win by any means necessary. I don't yes. need to fucking hit my finish. I just got to get the fuck out of here. Yes. And, yes. and they don't have that anymore in wrestling. Like, like, oh. That's like, across the board. Every promotion, they got to Everyone's got to hit their freaking finisher. I would love it if Cody hits the finish and kicks out, and then he just does something that you don't expect to pin Roman, and then he says in the press conference, I just needed to win. Like, it's been how many years? I just need to beat this guy. Like, it's, like you know what I mean? Like, just the thing you don't expect because it's like, what? okay, my finish doesn't work. But let me just try to trap this guy and let me just go. Because I just want to go. Because Bret Hart has a whole other match. Same thing with Perfect. They have a whole other match. So at, at that point in the match, I just, we just we just got to get this over with. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite matches of the modern day is uh, Sasha Banks versus Bailey from NXT Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. And that's the one slight problem I have with that match is like, I don't know if you remember the finish, but they're both in the top row. And 
Bailey does this like crazy like her Karana thing and Sasha like lands almost on her head, right? Yeah. And they should have just ended the match right there. But Sasha like gets up and does like the wobbly walk right into a Bailey to Bailey back. You know, what was that move? Bailey to Bailey? Bailey, ba- Bailey to Bailey or something. Yeah, yeah. She or does that. that to win. And I'm like, I get it. That's your finishing move. And that's probably like the whole WWF. That's how they teach you. But they didn't well, need to put that in. They didn't well, need to put that in. Well, you know what? You know what I heard interview, I think with Sheamus, where he went, he had like a really rough match on the pay per view before he got injured or on the show before. And he goes, I want to come out. I want to sell the injuries and I don't want to win with my finisher. I want to win with a weird move. And they said no. And Vince called him in. He goes, These people pay to see you make your entrance and they pay to see you make hit your moves. If you don't hit the moves, this guy, he paid for a babysitter. He paid for, and you're not hitting the bro kick. You're not hitting this, that, and the third. Um, that's what he paid to see you do. That that's like so you have to do your moves and and I I kind of get it, but at the same time it's like I don't wouldn't have been up. I I don't care if Sheamus wins without the bro kick. If he if he like if he if, if the story is he is trying to win so he can go rest again, I'm fine with him doing whatever the fuck he wants. You know? Yeah, I think I think that's more of a Vince thing. Vince thing where he goes like they. The all they care about is your entrances and your finish move. And it's no, like, I think that never switched why... the match because then you oh, yeah. you're all your stupid fucking bro kick. Yeah, but this is why WWE for a long time was in that bad period because yeah. he, you know, he starts Vince McMahon just starts, he starts, he basically, he junior starts getting lazy. You know, he starts well, getting well, lazy. No, he, he, the, everyone has to cater. There's a point where, uh, there's a point in the mid 2000s where everything has to cater to him and not to anyone else. And, yeah, uh, that's lazy. He's not even he's back then. Him. Even he's now, him. even though he's still like finagling things for his way on this show, uh, they're doing finishes for wrestling fans more so than like him. Like this is this is for this is for wrestling fans. This match. This isn't yeah. for for Vince. Yeah, I agree. You mentioned Hogan before, and we're gonna get Hogan now. We get a shot of a giant Hogan face and it's on Jimmy Hart's the back of his Boy. jacket. And we see Hulk Hogan with oh, Mean Gene oh. as it pans out. Hogan cuts a promo on Yokozuna and he makes a point that he's the five-time WWF champion. Now, at this point, he's the first five-time WWF champion, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're gonna... Can I say something? Yes, of course. Hogan putting Jimmy Hart... Like, and this was Hogan's idea. And Hogan, like... Having Jimmy Hart by his side is one of the worst decisions Hulk Hogan has ever made. If I was Vince McMahon, I would I would have said to him, "You walk out with Jimmy Hart, I'm just gonna fire you. Like I'm not even gonna like I'm just gonna like completely rip up your contract because that is a horrible idea." I think him having Jimmy Hart next to him did more to make him uncool than anything he ever did. I, I don't, and that's why like when fucking. Uh, um, Penta and Feel Fennec, Ray Fenix walk out with that that idiot, like Alejandro Yeah, he just makes them look like fucking losers. Like the wrong guy makes you look like Jimmy Hart starts yelling in this promo, and it's like it just completely, it completely ruins Hogan's vibe. It's 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 like oh my god, it's like if fucking CM Punk started walking out with like Ricardo Rodriguez. Like he comes back because he come back on Monday. He's like. My new assistant, Ricardo Rodriguez, and like Ricardo's cutting the promos for Punk, and he, but Punk is still like a badass face. We're supposed to still do, like, oh, it's so bad, it's so bad, dude. I, I'm and Jimmy Hart, I love him. He's a legend. He doesn't age, but dude, does not age. Hogan, I don't know why Hogan ever thought this was a good idea. Why? What? What is with uh, Hogan? Even t- did it would he's gonna be with Jimmy Hart. To this day, for like decades, they, you know, he pays yeah, for, Hart, when he goes to Roy, he pays Jimmy Hart to come for him. Yeah, 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 for like decades, right? Yeah. But what? Why does Hogan like Jimmy Hart so much? I think Jimmy Hart was basically his assistant and didn't, didn't question him. I think, you know, I think when you become big, you need someone like that, and that's fine. But he doesn't need to be on camera next to him. Like if Jimmy Hart is like your assistant and he takes care of things for you, and no questions asked. I I heard that's how it is. Like no questions asked, Jimmy Hart will take care of it for Hogan. Like, if he needs a body buried, it's buried. That's great. And I'm glad you guys have such a great relationship. And at this point, you know, Hogan has said, Jimmy Hart's my last friend left. Like, everyone else is dead. Oh, so sad. And so, like, now, like, so, like, 
If Hogan walked out on Raw tomorrow with Jimmy Hart, I'm not gonna. I'm not. Gonna, eh, this, this is not cool because like they're both old. You know, like let yeah, him walk yeah, out yeah. with Jimmy Hart. Well, not Jimmy Hart. He ain't old. Yeah, and I mean, I feel like Jimmy Hart's gonna die before Hogan anyway because that's just what's happening. So I'm not gonna be like, oh my god, I can't believe Hogan's with you. But in '93, no, dude, I don't, dude. You did so much damage to yourself walking out with this guy. So much, bro. You know what though? Junior could not have said no to this though. That's no, Hogan. I would have said no to it. I would have been like, I'm, I'm protecting you, Terry. Protect no, I think you would have been like, if it, if he ain't coming out, I'm not going out. I would have been like, Ugh. I probably would have done that. Yeah. Well, you know. Yeah, yeah. I would have been like, but you know what? I, but but here's the other too. Man, I think he's Junior. I think he's an idiot. But I think this is one of those calls. I think he had no shot of turning this down. Like he had no shot. It's you just, know? just Jimmy Hogan Hart. Hogan gets what Hogan wants, brother. Just Jimmy Hart. And the other thing too, Jimmy Hart does nothing to help in the finish. The they, like there's all this interference. Though. Jimmy Hart's just standing there like an idiot in the match. It's like he's so like the whole reason to have a Jimmy Hart there is to make sure shit like that doesn't happen. And meanwhile, he's getting fire in his eyes, get sit on. It's like what the fuck well, is this? This is that six match. It is for the WWF World Title. This is not the main event. It's Kind of like right in the middle of the show, it is Yokozuna who comes out with Mr. Fuji with lots of Japanese photographers facing the champion, Hulk Hogan, who beat Yokozuna for the title at WrestleMania. He comes out with Jimmy Hart. Hogan looks very lean uh, because he is off the juice, but the commentators uh, tell us that Hogan, uh, he got himself lean because he wants to give himself more speed, which is great cover, I thought. Um yeah, to run from the fucking uh, feds. Yeah, to run from the feds, exactly. Uh, give them more speed from the, I guess, away from the feds. Um, they try to match strength, but Ho- Yokozuna is too much for Hogan to handle. They did mention that Hogan gained like 50 more pounds. Um, Hogan dodges a splash, and he comes back, and he bites Yokozuna. This is the second bite of the night. Um, Yokozuna fights back, but he misses another splash. And this time on the mat, both men are slow to get up. And Hogan starts running the ropes and he shoulder blocks Yokozuna uh, that drops Hogan, but does not even budge Yokozuna. And everyone's like, <gasps> Yokozuna starts putting on a long bear hug, long bear hug, and hits a very devastating belly to belly, which Hogan no sells and he pops right back up. But let me tell you something though uh, Hogan gives Yokozuna most of this match. Yeah, he does, but like to say that this is like a burial, I can't say it is. I mean, like, like I said, there was this moment where he, he gets into that belly, but he just pops right up and everything. It's like it's not a burial. Yeah, but the like, end of the match is like they destroy him post match, they drag him out, they do a lot to like well they do a lot okay. at the end. Let's say let, we're gonna keep going into it. Mm-hmm. So he starts hulking up and Yoko and he starts hitting Yoko, but Yoko won't go down. And finally, though, after the third boot. Yoko finally goes down, but he kicks out of the leg drop, and everyone's kind of in, in shock because you don't kick out of Hogan's leg drop. Hogan attacks uh, Fu- Mr. Uh, Mr. Fuji gets in the apron, and Hogan attacks him, but as the referee is checking on Mr. Fuji, uh, a ZZ Top-looking photographer is up on the apron, and Jimmy Hart goes to get him off the apron, and he gets kicked, which draws Hulk Hogan's attention, and as Hogan goes to him. A fireball comes out of the camera, hits Hogan in the face. Yokozuna hits the leg drop to reclaim his WWF title. The guy cosplaying as Hulk Hogan in the front row, he is not amused. (laughs) But it's not over because Yokozuna then drags Hulk Hogan to the corner and he bonsai splashes him for good measure. Did Did you see that video? I sent you of that kid in the front row who, like, he he looks devastated. I know. He, this kid, little kid in the front row, when Yokozuna and Bonsai splashes him, he's just like, <laughs> he gets so I'm devastated. devastated. He's not the only sad kid in the audience. They show other kids. There's one kid that, like, watery eyes. That is the match. Uh, just one Bonsai drop on Hogan. That was it. Um, I did not think this was a bad match this actually was entertaining um, it's a good it was... listen when hogan put the thing people call like hogan doesn't put anyone over because when hogan puts you over he puts you over yes he goes all the way he didn't like he could have like fucking like got back up he could have like cut a promo in the back instead like he's just gone now 
That's it. After all that time, he's gone. He got destroyed. Yeah, he, and put, left. he put Yokozuna over in this match. 100%. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, he put you over. And he did that with Yoko. He did that with Goldberg. And he did that with Brock. When he So yeah. when, when it's time for you to... And he, The Rock, too. But Brock, he really let, he really lets Brock destroy him. When, when Brock... Le, when he put over Brock Lesnar in 20, 2002 or something like that, would you consider that a burial? Of Hogan? Yeah. Um... Uh, well, no, because Hogan was old, but it was the right thing for Hogan to do. And then how come this is a burial then? Because I wasn't done with Hulk Hogan. I'm oh, not done, oh, like oh, because it's oh, it's because of how you feel. All right, because it, it is that, a burial because they're moving on from Hulk Hogan. It's not time to move on from Hulk Hogan yet. From this, I it's fair, but it's not. Wouldn't you say it's fair to say it's not really a burial? If Hogan, if Hogan showed up on Monday Night Raw and was like, "I want one more match with Yokozuna at SummerSlam," it's not a burial. But the fact, like, he just goes away after this, it is a burial. And Macho Man, they keep they. I don't know if you noticed, but in Macho Man's commentary, he kind of alludes that WrestleMania was a fluke. They start adding that WrestleMania Nine was a fluke, and like, you know, Hogan's got to prove that he actually beat this guy and. Macho Man's digging in a little bit secretly, but yeah, yeah, it is. It like like if Co okay, so Cody Rhodes, if Cody Rhodes gets squashed twenty years from now. That's that's not a burial. It's time to move on. But he gets squashed at WrestleMania forty in the main event. That's a burial. Like I'm ready for Cody to have the fucking belt. I'm not done with him. We need we need a few more years with with the Cody. And that's saying I what hear what you're saying, but I don't like I I don't think this is a burial. When I when I look at the Brock match that he has with Hogan, where Brock like takes Hogan's blood and smears it on his chest, that's more brutal than what happens here. And even that Brock one, I don't consider a burial. So if I don't consider that a burial, this is not a burial. Well, as but well. also he does come back from the Brock thing, and him and Brock become friends on SmackDown the next year. Um, so like. It, it it's like part of a continuing storyline. Like it's not like, and the Hogan is still in the company after Brock leaves, and he's wrestling Shawn Michaels and Kurt Angle. So it's not like Brock destroy. It's a way to get Brock over, which was great. Um, but I oh, you know, I also think Hogan did that. You know, I think Hogan did that with Brock. By the way, he's scared because of Brock. To no, to show up Steve Austin. Like, oh, you don't want to lose. You stormed out because you don't lose to Brock on a random Raw. Well, I'll lose to Brock on a random SmackDown, and I'll lose. More than anyone's ever lost. I think he did it to like spite Austin. That was a great match, by the way. Brock what? versus Hogan. Oh yeah, it was it was fantastic. Oh, but I, but I, that's when, when, the way he lost. I was not expecting that. I was like, but that's Jesus. what like Hogan should do. I think that did more for Brock than anything they did for him that year. That did more for Brock. Yeah, I mean, look at us. We're still talking about it. Yeah, yeah, and, I, and that set up Brock. I think that did more for Brock than that fucking streak than beating the streak. Um. But uh, I'm I'm not ready as a fan in 93. Look, you don't have to have him have the belt, but I'm not ready for him to go away. I'm not ready for him to lose this decisively. Yokozuna, to me, I'm, I'm telling you right now, I like Yokozuna. He wasn't the guy to chase Hogan out of this fucking company. It, um, if, if Hogan must leave, I would have had, had Lex be the guy to beat him like this, or I would have had uh, Razor Ramon beat him like this. It was not Yok Yokozuna wasn't the guy. It was the wrong guy to to beat Hogan like this. It is what it is. It was what it was. But um, as a fan, and there were a lot of kids my age who felt the same. All you did was chase me away. You didn't. You almost lost, dude. He he has to fire Brett in '97 because he's running out of money, and it starts here. Okay, good. That's a fair point. That's a very fair point. I mean. If you don't like Hogan, I, um, this is a great match because now Hogan's gone and now like, it's a whole new era. But I think the majority of fans didn't give a fuck. I didn't give a fuck. Dude, I didn't give a fuck for 31 years about this Bret Hart Mr. Perfect match. Now that I've seen it, I'm giving it its flowers. I did not give a... You know, like, dude, from high school to college to working at Caroline's, my parents passing away, to meeting my family, to getting tattoos, to getting banned from Caroline's, to COVID, to the lockdowns. I never gave a fuck about this Bret Hart show because of what they did to Hulk Hogan. My whole life, I've went through journeys. And I had two car crashes. Yeah, and I've only watched this now because I I don't think if I we if you said I don't want to do this podcast, I don't think I ever saw. I would have died with, before that before seeing this event. That's terrible. You would have missed this great match. And right? it's a great match, but because of the fucked up booking, like 
you you chased people away because yeah, that's a great match, but like, and there was such a great roster, dude. That's the other thing too. This roster was you look back the ninety three roster is so fucking talented. Like, there's so many different ways you can incorporate Hogan if you keep him yeah. around and Savage. There's so many different like fucking game plans you can go. Hogan Diesel, Hogan Shawn Michaels, Macho Man Shawn Michaels, Macho Man Brett. Fucking bring in Piper. Uh, maybe Piper and Hogan and Macho Man form like an NWO. And they're like trying to take out the young guys. Fucking a Luger. Luger versus Hogan. Luger versus fucking Savage. Luger versus Warrior. There's so many different things you can do. Fucking, and you don't do any of it. Um, One thing we could both agree on, though. Hogan versus Yoko was 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 an entertaining match. Though. It's a pretty it good a- match, and like I and you know, I I think the reason why Hogan's very delicate with jobs is because when he does it, he makes sure you get over hard. Mm-hmm. Yes. All right. So so far we're enjoying this pay per view, and we got to move right along to Terry Taylor, who's in the back, and he tries to catch uh, Mister Perfect, and he asks, "Hey, how you feeling?" And he's like, "How am I feeling? He's I'm pissed off. I just lost. I'm out of the tournament." And he says he doesn't want to talk about it. This goes to Mean Gene, who is with Shawn Michaels and his new bodyguard. And Gene asks him, um, do you think uh, lightning can strike twice? And you think uh, two people are going to lose their titles tonight? Because Hogan already lost the title. And Shawn Michaels goes, it's not going to strike twice because Hulk Hogan is not like Shawn Michaels. See, Hulk Hogan is a dinosaur. I heard this. Let me tell this is another thing that would have chased me away and I never would have came back at 12. I'm, I, now I don't care, but at 12, I would have been like, I would have been like, I'm never watching. I don't care what happens. I'm never going to yeah. watch the video if I can. Yeah. Shawn Michaels, by the way, yeah, this is his words. I'm not even getting it. He just goes, I'm not, it's his words. Dinosaur. That's what I'm yeah. saying. Like, they keep, they keep like adding salt to the wound about Hogan losing. They, you think, uh, you think, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Vince McMahon told him to say. Yes, I think Hogan I think the message on this show was we're done with Hogan. We're moving on hard. We're hard moving on. The company is moving on. Even Mean Gene is kind of very dismissive of Hogan. Like he's just like, oh, I got work. Like before, like Mean Gene be like, I'm, I'm at the doctors with Hulk Hogan. We're trying to see if he's okay. They kind of just like, yeah, Hogan went to the hospital, but we, we still have this show going on. Like, like he'll yeah, be- yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I Me- think at twelve, I would have been, I would have been fucking livid. Would have been if I was watching this live. I would have left. I just would have left. <laughs> would have left. Mean Gene, he asks about the bodyguard. Hey, who's this bodyguard guy? And and Shawn Michaels goes, his name is Diesel, as in Diesel Fuel, because he's like a Mack truck, uh, which was a great little introduction to Diesel. Unfortunately, he's barely going to do anything in this. Table. Well, he just he just got there, so I don't know. I don't know if they knew what they had. You know what? I you know what? I when I when I, I don't. Do you remember the nineties? If you were buff, people would say you look mad diesel. Yeah, you have that. I thought, and actually, this is Shane McMahon came up with the name, but Vince didn't apply like that. So when I heard that the world champion was Diesel, I thought they called him Diesel because he was like so. It was like, oh wow, oh, you, you thought they were saying the the the, the champion is buff. Yeah, he's like Diesel. Yeah, so I'm like, that's cool. Like they're incorporating hip hop lingo, and then my friend goes, "Oh no, no, it's it's just like he's like a truck," and I'm like, well, "That's fucking stupid." But you know, Shane McMahon came up with that with that name. So he said to his dad, "Yeah, when I'm at the gym, like, oh, you're looking Diesel. We should call this guy Diesel." And um, that's what they should have just went with, not this whole truck bullshit. Okay. Brum, brum, brum. That fucking lame music. Um, I didn't mind it when I was a kid. Um, I mean, I like the Diesel <laughs> outfit. This is yeah, but this is pre Diesel outfit. This is like no leather. He's wearing like a denim jacket. Yeah. Um, you know what's weird about that? You mentioned the Diesel. I felt like I didn't hear people use the word Diesel to mean buff until this guy showed. Up. I no, I I heard it before he showed up. Oh, I felt like I, that's. I thought like people were when they started saying I'm looking Diesel. I I I, they I for a second in 95 cuz he was a champ i thought that it cuz i heard more people say it in 95 i did think that maybe wwe was getting more popular and people were saying like oh you look like diesel but yeah, no, yeah, yeah, it yeah, never yeah, had yeah, anything yeah. to do with diesel oh. we're going to go to match number 7 it is an eight man tag the smoking guns and the steiners versus money incorporated and the head triggers who come out with afa scott steiner and dibiase they start and scott is just way too much for DiBiase as he sends DiBiase not once but twice over the top rope with a clothesline. 
Fatu and Bart get in there, and Fatu takes him down with a nice super kick. Jim Ross says Billy Gunn got a rodeo scholarship, and Bobby mocks him. Like, <laughs> a rodeo scholarship? He a brings that up for like years. He thinks that's so fucked. That makes dude that 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 makes him ruin. That yeah, ruin. but I had to look this up. That's actually actually a real thing. A rodeo guy, real rodeo scholarships. Well, the rodeo is a big deal in other parts of the country. Yeah, it's a real thing. A rodeo scholarship is a real thing. It's good money. Everyone takes turns uh beating on Bart Gun. They're just like you know beating on him, beating on until there's a double clothesline. By the way, what do you call it when uh? Two guys clothesline each other. Double clothesline. Okay, then what do you call it when a a tag team holds hands and then they fucking clothesline somebody together? That does what? I'm sorry, repeat that. Okay, then what do you call it when a tag team holds hands and they both clothesline somebody together? Um, Running clothesline. Are you sure that's not called a double clothesline as well? Well, I think it's both called double close on yeah. Okay. It's just a double meetings. Oh, um, there's a news update. Sure. Uh the women are, are the the uh the women in AEW are unhappy with how much Mercedes is getting paid. So they'll probably they'll probably Oh if you wanna we wanna talk about that rap after we finish this match. Yeah, uh yeah, finish this dopey match, okay. which I by the way, I thought All this right. match stunk. This was their first. Billy Gunn, he hot tags in. DiBiase puts on the uh, Million Dollar Dream, but DiBiase drops out of it for some reason. He just drops it. And even the commentators are like, why did DiBiase because just he, like... He's ready, he's ready to retire. Oh, that's, that's yeah. Story. DiBiase goes to pick him up. Billy Gunn inside Kratos in for the entire win. For the win. All hell breaks loose. Everyone's fighting. Rick Steiner never got in this match. I don't know if you Yeah, this that. match was a fuck. I hate this match. This match was a complete waste of time for all eight of these guys. I just would have done the Steiners versus the Head Shrinkers again. Or if you yeah. want to get the smoking guns on the card, have them fight the Head Shrinkers, leave the Steiners off. It was a waste of time. Yeah, actually, I have to re- reassess what I said from the beginning. There, this was the only stinker on the show. This it was, and also like you didn't need it. Like, I, I mean, I think you did need it because they wanted people to like calm down from the Hogan loss in case people. Yes, like yes. This. Mm-hmm. But I just would have had it been a tag match. Yeah, and I think they wanted to showcase all four tag teams. Yeah, but then Rick Steiner's not even funny. in the match. Yeah, it was just it was just like yeah, right. It wasn't good. So like a waste. Like you have like the best tag team in the world, and like one guy's even getting the ring. Yeah, exactly. Let's talk about this big news. Take a little break from this King of the Ring. Sasha Banks, uh, Mercedes Monet. She was signed to AEW. She's getting millions. Mm-hmm. Somebody said uh, I, I reportedly she is the highest paid uh, minority female wrestler of all time. Right. Yeah, ever, ever, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if you're if you're a wrestler, uh, uh, no, a, a female wrestler on the roster, and you're jealous of this, I totally get why you're jealous of this. Um, but I also don't see why that's a problem. It's actually a lot of other people have brought up the point that this is actually a good thing for the wrestlers because now that's the benchmark. You know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, but you do. You, I don't ever think that. Sky Blue is going to get a tenth of what she's making. I think she's making this because she was in WWE. Of course, of course. Yeah. But, and, and, but and at the same time, I understand Sasha Banks, draw. Sasha Banks is a draw, by the way. She, she is. is. She is. But my thing, if I'm one of these women, like okay, Ruby Soho or Anna J that went through thumbtacks and had fucking did one of these, uh, you know, these CCW matches on fucking Rampage that nobody watched. I would, um, and my pay hasn't improved since then. And my push hasn't improved. I would say next time Tony Khan comes up, he's like, I want you to go through a flaming table with your fucking tits into fucking thumbtacks. They'd be like, no, I'm not doing that. Yeah, they, because, of course. They shouldn't have been doing, doing that to they begin They shouldn't have done that personally. I can yeah. see why you're like, dude, the reason why you need Sasha Banks is you don't cap. When we did all this stuff and everyone was talking about us, you didn't capitalize on it. And we're back to square one. Now you're going to bring in Sasha Banks and Okada. But if you just capitalize on us, uh, maybe... I, mean, I don't think it's. I don't think this is possible. But uh, that's why I don't think Anna J should have fucking jumped through fucking fire. Maybe if you if you fucking pushed Anna J, she'd be a difference maker like Sasha Banks is or Mercedes Monet. But you don't. You 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 make people do dumb shit and then you just forget that they're even in your company. And I guarantee you, 
Two things are going to happen with Mercedes Monet. Good for her, she's getting all this money. Two things are going to happen. Either she's going to get into drama, because I've heard, and I'm not going to tell you, I'll tell you off air, she's a major problem backstage. She caused, I heard she's going to get into some drama like Punk and get fired. Uh, or um, she's going to be on Rampage in a year, fucking fighting Ruby Soho. She'll be the highest paid person on Rampage. And that's great. And she should be. Yeah. But Tony Khan, all he does is waste money. It's not going to be a difference. Yeah. But, you know. But good uh, for so- her. Yeah, I if people are. I think yes, Tony Khan is just he's spending money like wildfire. But his family is so loaded; they're never gonna go out of business unless. So I understand. I understand that, but yeah. like, I think a lot of these people did what they did to their bodies, thinking that like, and this is the problem I had at Carol. Yeah, but that's stupid. That's like the same thing we're talking about. How like, uh, it doesn't matter about like work rate sometimes. You it, know? Doesn't. Like, it doesn't. It doesn't. But. Good. But that's not what's gonna. But you were sold. Draw, you were sold when AEW started. You were sold a fucking bill of goods that like this guy's a work rate fan. If you put in the work rate, he's gonna. And they had it. Listen, I think they had a a lot of the AEW originals. People still love. He just keeps adding to the roster, and people get lost in the shuffle. And and um, I could see it being frustrating for someone like, hey man, like I've killed myself now for five years. And all you do is just keep bringing in new people. And all I get is less TV time. It doesn't matter what I do. Oh, yeah. A hundred percent. And the ratings keep going. The ratings keep going down. They don't go up. Put it back in safely. That would be amazing. He broke. Um, Um, Yeah, I see that. And uh, I think this is what I think from when you told me. I think the reason if, if, in fact, there are female wrestlers in AEW who are upset with how much um, Sasha Banks is making... I think part of the reason why they have a problem with that is because Sasha Banks, before she debuted, did this interview where she said she's going to go back to WWE one day, and I think that's that's the other thing. But also, I don't, I don't, I, I don't think that's a reason to get upset because everyone in the history of everywhere has gone back to WWE. So I agree. Uh, I I think it's bullshit, and I and I don't. When people go, I'm never going back. I don't respect those people. I think you're I think you're full of shit. I don't think that should have been something to get upset about. Yeah, I, I like okay, like I said, I understand why people would get mad that she's making more money than you, but I also at the same time think, um, you know what? Think outside the box. Then it's kind of that situation. If you don't like it, you could always leave AEW too. You know. Like I mean, I think if them. if someone like Sky Blue or Anna J left right away, WWE would give them a push just because they're Sky Blue or Anna J. I think uh, they keep... um, Sky Blue should know, start a Sky Blue should start OnlyFans. Ugh, yeah, it's like you're not a Sky Blue fan at all. The quality of wrestling with those two is just no. I'm not a fan of them because I don't think they're. Wrestling I'm not a fan of Anna J. I'm a, I'm a fan of how Sky Blue. I don't think Sky Blue. I don't, don't like her gimmick. Her gimmick was that she likes the color blue. It's like, dude, I don't fucking. That's for stupid. the amount of screw, the amount of fucking TV time Sky Blue has gotten the last three years. She's not. She has not improved. Yeah, she's exactly. Done. She hasn't moved. That's why I don't like her. But I don't, she's I don't like any. I like wrestling, and I, if you're not good at wrestling, I, then but you're in wrestling, then you're useless. And I think someone like Sky Blue, she, you know who she reminds me of? She reminds me of like Giant Gonzalez. Yeah, in the sense that Giant Gonzalez got to be on TV and pay per views how he looked. Right, he's a dude, big dude. Sky Blue is the same thing. She gets to be on pay per views, gets to be on TV because of how she looks. But just like Giant Gonzalez, she's not good at all. And we have somebody like um, Athena Ember Moon, who's not on pay per views, who's who's better wrestler. You know, but she ain't gonna get on it because Sky Blue's taking that spot, and that's why I don't like people like Sky Blue. That's why I don't like people like Anna J. They're just not good wrestlers. Um, but they make me sick. Yeah, they make me sick. Mean this this next scene is probably what made you sick. Mean Gene, he is with Jack Tunney, the president of WWF. He is with the new champion Yokozuna and Mister Fuji, and they're doing they're with all the Japanese presses, Japanese music playing, and. Jack Tunney congratulates them and he says, Thank God you kicked that stupid Hulkamania, Hulk Hogan out of here. And Fuji says, Yokozuna is 550 pounds. Hulkamania is dead. He says that. Hulkamania is dead. And he says, uh, 
what's his name? Mr. Fuji goes, Prince Akihito will celebrate. All of Japan will celebrate. And uh, Gene asks him, how are you going to celebrate? And Mr. Fuji goes, oh, I got a big celebration coming up. And I, they're alluding to the uh, intrepid thing, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm wondering what, because, so they book Lex Luger to hit Tatanka in the head, right? At the end of that match. So he's on a heel road. I'm wondering when they announced, like, we're going to do something, what the original plan was. Because they must have had something else in mind. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, I, I feel like. Do you think maybe, like, maybe, like, Hogan was like, I might stick around, but we'll talk after the show. So maybe Vince was like, okay, so we'll have Hogan like challenge him on the Intrepid. And then like after the show, they're like, yeah, let's just go our separate ways. And then he he jumped on the Lex thing. I don't know. Yeah, no, I think, um, I don't think when they did this, they had in mind that this was like Hogan's like complete, like at this point after this, he's not going to be back for the company for well, he does have a few. He he does wrestle on the TV taping. Then uh, the next week, he fights the Beverly Brothers with Brother Brudai, and then he does house shows against Yokozuna in Europe. So that's proof right there that they weren't completely done. But I think something happened where there was like some kind of uh, issue. Between... I think it was the trial. Yeah, yeah, and that's what changed his plans. And I think that's why he says, "Guys, I need a new, I need a new all American." Um, you know. Yeah, because the well, the Hogan matches are in August, so he's already going with Lex in August. Um, uh, what was I gonna say? You know what the weird thing was too that kind of I kind of annoyed me. Remember, like Survivor Series ninety one, Jack Tony sees this interfering, like the title's held up. We gotta have a Royal Rumble here. Fucking Hulk Hogan gets fire in his eyes, and Jack Tony's like, "Hey, congratulations, a new champ." It's like, really? Like you you held up the title because an urn was used. And you don't want to, and you're just gonna allow this fire thing. Like the fire thing's okay. By the way, that's another reason why I don't think it was burial because Hulk Hogan didn't even give him like he didn't. Yoko didn't even beat Hogan clean, right? Like he Make needed stick. he needed that fireball to help him beat him. That's, Doesn't matter. Listen, burial, it could have not a very. <laughs> let me tell you, Andrew. If if they had recovered from this, even if Hogan came back at WrestleMania ten, I might have. But the fact that, like, this is it for him for nine years, mm-hmm. it made me stop watching. We should ask if the listeners, if you're a listener and you're going to comment on this, let us know. Do you think the Hogan versus Yoko was a burial to Hogan? I don't think it was. Um, I, but they'll, it, they'll let us know. It makes me physically ill what they did to the Hulkster. Yeah. Let's go to match number eight. It's for an Intercontinental Championship. You just brought that up. It is Crush versus the champion. Shawn Michaels who comes out with Diesel. Crush knocks. Shawn Michaels out of the ring with a tackle right away. Crush is way bigger than Shawn Michaels. Everyone agrees that Shawn Michaels has to use his speed to counter Crush's size and power. And Crush makes a mistake. Uh, and no, and use his speed and get Crush to make a mistake. But Crush is able to drop kick Shawn Michaels back out of the ring again. Crush military presses Shawn Michaels and hits the tour of the island, tilt the world backbreaker. It's a very impressive move. But Diesel is able to pull Shawn Michaels out of the ring um, before he can make the cover. That's the one thing Diesel's going to do in this match. Crush goes outside, and Shawn Michaels hits him from behind, and Diesel bonks his head on the post, uh, bonks Crush's head on the post. Shawn Michaels uh, bangs his head on the post, uh, Crush's head on the post a whole bunch of times, uh, the back of his head. That looked devastating. People don't do that move anymore, but I think they should do it. Shawn Michaels basically grabbed Crush's head, but he put his hands like behind Crush's head and he starts banging his head on the post. So it looks like Crush's head is hitting the post, but it's really Shawn Michaels' hands, right? But I don't know. Yeah. It looks cool. It looks really yeah, it cool. Looks, looks good, yeah. yeah. Um, and then Shawn has to like pick up Crush's limp body and throw it back into the ring. Crush is able to fight back though, and he picks up Shawn Michaels and dumps him outside. Savage mentions this a few times, but he believes Crush can beat Yoko. He keeps mentioning that. I think Crush could beat Yokozuna. I think this guy could be the champion. Well, um, like, Ma- they were setting up Macho Man to be Crush's mentor. You remember the anger, right? Crush turns on yes, him. Yes, and Crush turns on him. So I think they're setting it up already because also Crush, if you if you watch the um the, the July 4th thing, Crush comes the closest to slamming him. 
and fails. And when Crush can't do it, because there's no faces left, like I guess nobody can slay Yokozuna, and then Lex shows up in the helicopter. Yeah, Crush, like at this point, he it looked like he was kind of being billed like as a top. And I mean, even remember when I was a kid, he was like the I big. thought he was gonna be the next Hogan in 1990. Yeah, yeah. I always thought that I, I always thought so too. It's just that he uh was just so lame. The the crush name, the the colors. Um, it was just so lame. I his like finisher was lame. His finisher was like just, everything about him was kind of lame. I liked Crush as a kid, and now uh watching especially this match, he stunk. He wasn't good. You know what? I'm the opposite. I hated Crush when I was a kid. But now that I'm like older, like I'm like, yeah, it wasn't so bad. Like I have uh, this is this is not for Shawn so Michaels. This is not a good match. It's not terrible. It's all right. I mean, like Crush wasn't given a lot either. He gave he was given a shitty finisher. He had to like fight a clown. You know, it's like he wasn't given. Yeah, a but lot. that was that that clown was the Undertaker Kane level. I mean, come on. Oh, uh, the best thing about this match is Doink was when Doink comes to the ring. Yeah, speaking of the clowns, so. Anyways, two doinks just show up. They're both smoking cigars, and Crush starts staring them down because, remember, Doink beat him at WrestleMania. And as Crush is staring them down, Shawn Michaels super kicks Crush from behind, and he bonks his head on the a turnbuckle, and he falls down for Shawn Michaels to win. As soon as the match is over, Crush chases the doinks out. That was the best part when the two doinks came out with smoking cigars. I like that, that was the best. Part. That was the best part. Yeah. Oh the God. two doings come out of smoking cigars. <laughs> um, Bam Bam Bigelow, he cuts a... Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, out. sorry. Just really quick. Yeah, I didn't like this match. I just wanted to reiterate that I didn't like this match. Yeah, it was okay for me. It was all right. It was like... Yeah. I thought that head thing... I expect a lot more from Shawn Michaels on a semi-main event in his prime. But anyway. Yeah. Um, It's better than the eight-man. I'll say that. Oh, it's way better than the eight-man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's and I like um, it better than Mr. Perfect, Mr. Hughes. I like Mr. Perfect, Mr. Hughes. I like that. I think Mr. Hughes is a very underrated wrestler. I think we're finding is. out a lot of people are very underrated. We're yeah, finding out like a lot of people. I think if Meltzer didn't like someone, I think people kind of took it as like fucking like groupthink, and he's just wrong about a lot of guys. Yeah, I agree. I think he's wrong. He's definitely wrong. I don't know what he said about Mr. Hughes, but I was I like, I think he didn't like Mr. Hughes. I don't know why Mr. Hughes didn't last in WWE. I felt um, like... He's kind of... I heard he's like a weird guy. Oh. Okay. Yeah. It's too bad because for a guy his size, he could fucking move. And the fact that he could rest... He was wrestling with sun, sunglasses on. That's he had a, He had that disease where he would just fall asleep. Narcolepsy or something. Narcolepsy? That's oh. what held him back. I, I, that's right. Jim Ross said the reason that he never really had... He... um. They thought he was on drugs, but he's like, no, I have this, I have this disease. And like back then people didn't know a lot about it. So I mm. think a lot of people like this guy is really fucked up. Oh, that's terrible. That's too bad. Cause that's not even his fault. He has narcolepsy. You know? Yeah, I know. But wrestlers are such liars. They just think you're lying. You're going to tell yeah. Them. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably true. They probably were like, oh, probably, Jake, probably Jake the snake and fucking Marty Jenny were saying the same thing. I have it too. I can't stop <laughs> passing out. <laughs> I have narcolepsy as well. I got narcolepsy. That's why I was like, Jake, you're snorting coke in front of me. No, it's my I narcolepsy. Was on somas. I was on I was on narcolepsy. I took three I took three narcolepsies. That's why I'm falling asleep. Um <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So um Bam Bam Bigelow, he cuts a very short promo and he comes down for the finals of the King of the Ring. This is match number nine. This is our final match. To crown the king of the ring, Bam Bam Bigelow versus Bret Hart. Bam Bam is well rested, and his power is way too much from Bret. From the start, he's just beating on Bret. Bam Bam Bigelow, Gorilla presses him down to the floor. From the ring, Gorilla presses him down to the floor and just keeps beating on him. Outside the ring, Bret throws Bam Bam Bigelow into the guardrails, and he starts to try to rally back until Bam Bam rams Bret's back into the post and then slams him on the walkway, which has no padding. Behind the ref's back, Luna Vachon comes out with a chair, and she whacks Brett on the back for good measure. Bam Bam hits a flying headbutt back in the ring to win the match. Mm -hmm. But Earl Hepner comes running down and says, Brett was screwed. You know, he got hit with a chair by Luna Vachon, and Howard Finkel, he says, the refs have reversed the decision, and Earl Hepner gets all mad, and he goes, no, you idiot. I said... 
not reverse, just the match continues. It's not over. So the match is now continuing. Was that a mistake, by the way? No, I think um I think they wanted to give Bam Bam the pinfall to uh set him up down the road as a as a title contender. I don't no, think no, can... I, I not that part. The part where Howard Finkel says the ref has reversed the decision and and, and Urhub is like, no, you idiot. Just that that could have been it, but all yeah, that could have been it. I don't maybe they they probably should just but the match must continue. I think they weren't supposed to say the reverse of the decision or something. Like yeah, that. yeah. Um, so this match is gonna continue. Bam 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 goes right back to the attack. Uh, he gets Brett in a backbreaker, and Brett's but Brett suplexes Bam Bam Bigelow. Uh, but doesn't matter. Bam Bam, bam is still in control, and Brett dumps Bigelow out, and then he dives on him from the outside. And then he tries to hit the sharpshooter on him, but he can't because he's got such big legs. And this is a very, unlike the first half of the match, this second half is more back and forth, back and forth. Brett is whipped into the corner, and Bigelow runs into a big boot, a big boot and then Brett goes on uh, Bam's shoulders, and he does a victory roll for the win. Savage goes into the ring and he celebrates with Bret Hart. And then Bret goes to Mean Gene, who's on the um, little like announcer stage. And he gets the robe and he gets the king gear. Um, before we get into the finish, what do you think about this match? Bam Bam versus Bret Hart. I liked it. You know, Bret Hart has said this is one of his favorite matches of all time. He thinks that Bam Bam, one of his best opponents, there is a, did you, I saw you listed a bunch of these for sale. Did you have the Bret Hart DVD? Yeah. There's a match in Barcelona with Bam Bam. He says it's fantastic. And there's another one on his other his Blu-ray set. So he he requests, because he picks the matches on his things, he always requests a Bam Bam match. I agree. I think these two were terrific opponents together. I don't like this match as much as uh, the Mr. Perfect match. I kind of feel Bam Bam getting the pinfall hurts the yeah. match. I don't think it needed that. I don't, um, it didn't I, need Luna. It didn't need Luna in there I doing get, that. I get why they did both things. I think in their mind, they were going to have Bam Bam challenge for the title down the road, right? Yeah. And the click fucking ruined everything for Bam Bam. And, and now he's not even, doesn't even get fucking toys made of him. But, um. Yeah, he does. Barely. Like, yeah, he barely. But, but my, he's not, a, he should be in the Hall of Fame. They should put him in the Hall of Fame. Um, yeah. Or at least the, uh, you know, that. Uh, no more legacy that, win. Okay. Legacy win. No. If Thunderbolt Patterson gets a fucking. Gets to walk out and talk about I put Bam Bam in the legacy wing, man. Put that up, Jesus. <laughs> but um But fucking uh what was I gonna say about this guy, Bam Bam? Um yeah, it was a good match. I liked it. I uh you know with the this is the thing about the, about that pinfall. You don't need to have Bret Hart, you don't need to do that to Bret Hart and then have the Jerry Lawler angle. If you're gonna end the show with him getting the shit beat out of him, it doesn't also need to be pinned. Um, there's a lot you could have done with Bret Hart and Bam Bam without actually pinning him for the one, two, three. Unless, like, and again, like maybe I'd be saying something different if in '94 they're main eventing SummerSlam or they're main eventing WrestleMania 11 together, Bret and Bam Bam. But they don't. They don't. So, yeah, in Bret Hart's autobiography, I don't know if it's this one or another match they had, but he said one time they're doing the victory roll finish. And Bam Bam farted in his face. <laughs> I think that was in a house show, yeah. Yeah, because when you're in that position, his ad is basically like in your face and he farts in his face. <laughs> that was very funny. Um, they, they, so there's a lot of things. There's a lot of little nuggets they drop on this show that they mm -hmm. don't follow up because they fucking pivot like crazy with their ideas. And yeah. I think like if... If this Bam Bam pinfall led to, like, down the road, I, I won the Royal Rumble. I'm challenging you, Brett, at WrestleMania 11. I already have a pinfall against you. It's bullshit it wasn't counted. I'm going to pin you again. Then you go, wow, long-term storyline. But it leads to nothing, you know? Yeah. Um, I would say, uh, by the way, everybody who's worked with Bam Bam, they always say he's, like, one of the best big men of all time. Even the clique, they, they really liked him, even though they fucking – Buried him. His life is living hell. They at the after he died. Like, the oh, fact that him. like he main evented WrestleMania and put on at the time the best celebrity match ever, and then got buried for months after that is just ridiculous to me. His career, the guy made him as WrestleMania, and his career goes down the toilet after that. I've never seen anything like that ever. Yeah, it's crazy. 
It's very, uh, by the way, so this match, this pay-per-view is not over. The matches are over, but Brett's getting his cr- king crown. He's getting the king uh, robe. When Jerry Lawler, who's in king gear, shows up and he goes, hey, there's only one king in wrestling. And he goes, Bret Hart, why don't you kiss my feet? And then Bret Hart goes, oh, you're more of a Burger King. And he starts getting a Burger King chant going. And then Lawler attacks Bret. And he starts beating him up, breaking all his stuff like his crown. And then he kicks Bret Hart down the stairs. Um, When I was a kid, I saw a recap of this, like the still shots on like superstars. Superstars, yeah, yeah. I read about it in the magazine. And I thought it was stupid then. And when I'm watching it now, it is still stupid. You know what Jerry Lawler looks like to me? And you know what he reminds me of? Eddie Kingston. Um, the problem with Jerry Lawler is, to me, because I would I would see in the Black and White magazines, and he was always very anti-WWF, uh, WCW. He was like kind of like, I'm the indie guy, right? Before there was indies, right? Um, he seemed very small time. Stench of failure, right? And... To make your top face, you're kicking out Hogan, and your big angle at the end is this fucking indie guy. And again, at the time, I know people say he's a legend. To me, he was a fucking indie guy, and he looked out of shape. And he looked, and I, you know, I, I met him once in Times Square. He was eating like fucking Big Macs. Like he, he eats McDonald's. He doesn't work out. He eats McDonald's. He drinks Cokes. He looks like a guy who does that. But to have like the closing angle be like this guy with the cheesy mic work. That's another turnoff. Like, so you're telling me Hogan's gone, and this is your this guy, and is your who who looks like shit, who fucking cuts corny fucking promos, is like no, like give me a fucking yeah, break. It, it's corny because it's like there could only be one king, and like what the hell are you talking about? It's nice like would he have done that? Yeah, if Bam Bam or Mister Hughes had won, if Razor had won, like. And then it just makes his like already like I didn't take Jerry Lawler as a threat because he's already he was just a commentator already, so already like he's beating up Brad and he's and it doesn't do anything for I, to me even now it doesn't do anything for Jerry it just takes away from Brad. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, and, I felt- and, and to me, it and I knew this as a kid. They want to keep Brad away from the world title, so they're making him waste his time with this fucking loser. And look, I now I love Jerry Little Lawler, but I'm telling you how I saw this as a 12 year old. You're telling me Hogan's gone, and now one of the main characters is Jerry the King Lawler. I'm out. I'm out. Give me, give me a fucking break. Might as well Michael P.S. Hayden. Oh, yeah, yeah, he does come by. Like, yeah. give me a fucking break. <laughs> it look, yep. But All he right. really reminds me. Of, he really reminds me of like Eddie Kingston. Like, like, oh yeah, okay. In theory, he's great at pro wrestling, but like. I don't need him to be in the top angle beating up the top guy. It doesn't look realistic. I don't care he that Brett like Eddie Kingston if he ate a lot of uh, ramen noodle moon cells. Hey, come on. Um, overall, though, I would say this is a good pay-per-view to watch overall. My favorite matches on this, Bret Hart versus uh, Mr. Perfect. I would say, play. yes, watch the tournament. Skip everything that's not in the tournament. Um, but if you just watch the tournament, it's, it's a fantastic show. That, you you want to watch Hulkamania get killed? Watch. But can shit. I tell you the other thing that I don't like? I didn't like Jerry Lawler with Vince, and we'll get into it more as we get along. That was another reason that kept me away from the show, because I thought they had, I, and I thought Jerry Lawler's voice was annoying. I thought he was like a fucking dollar store Bobby Heenan. Jerry Lawler doesn't become a good commentator until him and Jim Ross are alone. And I think then you he might becomes, have a good point. Yeah, I think you're right. And, and then he becomes one of the best. I yeah. would. I remember shocked in 1998 how much better Jerry Lawler becomes in 1998. I was like shocked. Like that's that's when he like, to me that's when he hits the next level and he becomes a legend is 1998 with Jim Ross. Before that I'm like this, this I'm like they, they, they got rid of Bobby Heenan they don't know what to do so they have this fucking loser who won the fucking fucking mud show world title 27 times Fucking doing commentary with his corny fucking jokes. This guy fucking stinks. And Vince, oh, what am I doing? It's so fucking unbearable. They had they had no chemistry together. I love that Jim Cornette has gotten Mud Show into the <laughs> into the uh, lexicon. Oh, Jim, he would be so upset. I'm calling Jerry Lawler and Jerry Jarrett show Mud Shows, but to me, it's like no. But they 
Yeah, you could say they're a bunch of yeah, yeah, yeah. Loser. The, All right, the king of losers. All right, guys, listen, we gotta. Uh, I, let's 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 talk. Let's talk turkey here, brother. Let's fucking yeah. roll it back, dude. Um, Friday, April fifth, ECW Arena, the twenty three hundred Arena at eight o'clock. They have basically a uh, reunion show of all the ECW stars. Uh, Shane Douglas will be there. Um, the Sandman, fucking the Dudley Boys, so many people from the ECW area. And I already heard some tons of tickets sold. Right after that, directly next door at Flaunt Fitness, we and Andrew Lee is now involved. We're doing the big ass extreme comedy bash. It is going to be a no holds barred fucking dirty comedy show. Uh, added to the show today, Gino Bisconti from Ooh. Compound Media. With his fiance Keanu Thompson, she will be hosting the show. I know I said we're not gonna have a host, but Keanu said she'll host. That's fine. Yeah. Um, fucking, if you're a fan of Compound Media, you gotta come check it out. I I handpicked Gino because Gino exemplifies extreme comedy, and he exemplifies that fucking in your face uh, behavior that uh that ECW had, and that's what the show is gonna be about. It's gonna be a tribute to extreme. Um, there's an, I'll put the Eventbrite link in the description. Come out if you're in the Philly area. You'll see this podcast. Come on out. Go to the ECW show. Fuck SmackDown. It's gonna you can watch that the next day. Don't don't go to Ring of Honor. Watch a bunch of flips. But also, we'll be done by the time if you do go to Ring of Honor. This show's gonna start after it's done. So when Ring of Honor and the ECW Tribute Show are done, you can just come on over here and see some comedy. Yeah, you're not going to be able to go to sleep. You're going to be jacked up anyway. Yeah, so. you can't go to the press conference and hear Tony Khan say how fucking great um, what's her what's her name is Athena is. Yeah, you no, know, and not answer questions about fucking Kevin Kelly. So you might as well. I can't answer that. I can't answer that. So you might as well come see us do comedy. We'll answer your questions about Kevin Kelly and Tony Khan. Fuck them both. Yeah. All right. In the meantime, so check the link in the description. In the meantime, <clears throat> let's review the next four weeks. Next week, Andrew Lee, we got Beach Blast 92. That's Davy Boy Smith and Sting versus Vader and Sid. Beach Blast 93. Beach Blast 93, sorry. In two weeks, SummerSlam 93. This, that's, I have, I'm going to have a lot to say about that one. Yokozuna versus Lex Luger. In three weeks, Fall Brawl 93, Team Sting versus Team Vader. And then in four weeks, Halloween Havoc 93 with Vader versus Cactus Jack. What are you looking forward to, Andrew Lee, bro? Oh, um, I. I don't know about the full pay-per-views because I don't know what the matches are on the cards, but I do want to see Vader versus Cactus Jack. I guess yeah, that's all I'm happy 1993. Because you keep mentioning SummerSlam and how bad it's going to be or something like that, I kind of want to see that now. What about you? Uh, I'm looking for, I'm, I'm looking for, I think I'm gonna, we're going to have some funny rants at SummerSlam 93. Um, but uh, I'm looking forward to, from an entertainment perspective, Halloween Havoc 93. I'm looking forward to Vader Cactus Shack in the main event. I think that should be a good time. Halloween I know it's, I, I've heard it's a great match. So, yeah, I mean, like uh, we all know how Mick Foley is when he's younger, and we and Vader is good. His matches are good. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, but uh, yeah, so that's what I'm looking forward to um the most. But uh, yeah, you know what? We're here's the thing. Even though I didn't watch this era, there's a lot to talk about. We're getting into like a very like. Because we grew up, well, you grew up on this era, but like, there's a lot of moving parts from different companies. There's a lot of stuff going down. Um, there's a lot of changes in the air. So there's a lot. I feel like there's a lot more to talk about as we get closer to '98 than there was like even in the early '80s and stuff. Because we grew up on a lot of these guys. We have a lot to say about that stuff. Yeah, we and I see... think I think uh, in the '90s is where it starts getting like real dirty. You know, like yeah. in the eighties, people just kind of like, oh, my, my time is done. I'm gonna go over to this promotion, and it's just kind of like a gentleman's agreement kind of thing, right? But in the nineties is where it starts getting like underhanded shit. It, it also kind of feels like a little. It gets a little personal between like Eric and Vince, although Vince exactly, likes. Yeah, yeah. From Vince never wants really to say he was at war with Eric. He claims he's at war with yeah. Ted. You're at war with Eric. Yeah, mm -hmm, absolutely. So yeah, uh, and, we're um, to see it. yeah. So. You know, it, it's going to be an interesting, interesting few up. Uh, I think that if you're enjoying the podcast, it's going to get better every week because even like, and again, like, even though I didn't grow, even though I didn't watch WrestleMania 10 live and for years I didn't watch it, 
I've gone back and rewatched that a million times. I've gone back and rewatched um uh which we'll go Halloween Havoc 94 a million times. So like I went back and enjoyed some of these shows, even though I, you know, after um I got back in in 1998. So we have a lot to say. Uh guys, that's the show. Please subscribe. Uh follow me on Instagram, Ray Goots, follow Andrew Lee, Andrew Son of Lee, and also on TikTok, Ray Goots Comedy. And we'll see you next week. We're hitting the beach with Beach Blast 93. Surf's up. Peace.